we commence, I would like to introduce a few key people we'll be hearing from this morning. And I'd like us to show them some appreciation each time their names are mentioned. So I'd like to start with the chairman of the event and the director general of the SEC. If you could be upstanding, Reverend Daniel Gamitete, shall we show him some love? Thank you very much, Reverend. The Deputy Director General for Legal of the SEC, Mrs. Deborah Malse Ajimfra. The Deputy Director General for Finance, Mr. Paul Abebu. We also have uh, the Superintendent of Police, Director of Interpol, Mrs. Naomi Aqua. She'll be joining us very shortly, so we'll introduce her when she comes. We also have the Deputy Executive Director in charge of Monitoring and Intelligence from Yoko, Mrs. Abba Opoku. Thank you. We have Mr. Edward Kujo, who happens to be the Director of Administration at Yoko. Mrs. Leonora Tokonu, the Head of Training and Protocol at Yoko. Thank you for joining us. And also, allow me to introduce some of our panelists today. We have Mr. Francis Buedu, who is the head of department at the SEC. We also have Mrs. Perpetua Vicentia Yangsin, who is a senior manager with the legal enforcement department. Our distinguished members of the press, we also applaud and appreciate your presence. And everyone here, can you please clap for yourselves? We are happy and pleased to have you. So at this juncture, it is my pleasure to invite the chairman of the program, Reverend Daniel Bamitete, to give us his opening remarks. Shall we please welcome him? Thank you very much, Godwin, and a good morning to all of you who have made time to come for this event, Time with the SEC. Uh, let me start by saluting the leadership of the CID and Yoko. We've had some engagements with them in the past, and indeed this session is a result of the engagements we've had with them. And so I'd like to start by acknowledging their support uh, throughout the time that we've had these engagements uh, with them. And also to thank all of you for uh, making the time to come to this event, time with the SEC. Uh, you'll be noting from the presentations that will be coming out that the focus will be around this whole area of uh, investment, savings and investment. Uh, I can tell you that for any economy to grow and to develop, um, one of the triggers is savings and investment. The ability of individuals and households to save, and then not only save, but invest um, is very key, a key driver, uh, because it is capital raised from savings and investment that is needed to drive economic uh, activity. Now, if you look at the statistics from, uh, let's say, the Ghana Stock Exchange, the CSD, if you look at the number of domestic um, participants in the market, um, in terms of share in, in value of uh, investment, you have local investors having about 32% while foreign investors have about 68% uh, in terms of share of uh, value of investment on the uh, Ghana Stock Exchange. If you come to our area and you look at the um, collective investment schemes, that's the mutual funds and then the unit trust, uh, you'll be hearing a bit more about them. Uh, again, you find that uh, the number of uh, people who have subscribed uh, is under a million. And um, if you look at the recent number that has been put out from the census uh, of our population of over 30 million, that clearly shows that there is a gap when it comes to uh, savings and 
uh, investment. And, and that is why we need to uh, not only talk about it, but we also need to uh, send the right signals to all the market operators uh, that their behavior is important. The need for them to religiously adhere to their fiduciary responsibility cannot be overemphasized. If we all take our minds to the recent cleanup that has taken place in the financial sector, uh, it's clear that unprofessional behavior, uh, or if you like fraudulent behavior, incompetent behavior on, on, on the part of market operators can be very, very expensive. Uh, you may know that um, when we did the, our, our, our part of the cleanup and we revoked the licenses, the value of assets and the management that uh, the affected operators had uh, was in excess of eight billion. Uh, and if you look at the claims that have come through, uh, it's heading north of the eight billion. You know, so clearly it's expensive. Um, government has uh, already um, in the bailout program uh, released quite a significant amount of money, um, over 4.3 billion so far. And that is just about halfway. So it's an expensive um, uh, issue when people do not behave well, uh, either because they are greedy, either because they are incompetent, or they, they, are, they are just not at the right place. And uh, we believe that um, it's time to send the right signals that bad behavior can and will be punished because we need to elicit more confidence in the uh, industry. And, and that's why um, having the session uh, with uh, a section of our law enforcement agencies is critical because we shouldn't countenance bad behavior. Um, we need to signal to the investing public that uh, rules and regulations are respected and are applied. And uh, you may also know that in recent times, we've had some unscrupulous elements coming up with money doubling schemes and all of that. And it's sometimes surprising to find people uh, falling for these schemes. Uh, let me put it on record that when it comes to investing, which really is what um, we are focused on within the securities industry, uh, investing is a journey that requires a deliberate, disciplined, and informed approach. Deliberate, disciplined, and informed approach towards channeling one's savings to various investment uh, instruments. It's important for individuals to understand that there is always a trade-off between risk and returns so that people are, are, must be guided, and especially when people come promising uh, you the moon. Uh, you need to understand that um, it doesn't work that way. In investing, it has to be deliberate, it has to be disciplined, you need the information, and there's always the trade-off. If the return is high, you can be sure that the risk is also high. But all this calls for information, and why we are here is also to um, let uh, those of you who are part of law enforcement agencies to get some more understanding into how the securities industry works uh, so that when you have to support us to punish bad behavior or to root out the unscrupulous elements in the system, uh, you do it from an informed position. Uh, we are the SEC. We know we have a charge to keep and the charge to keep is to promote the growth and development of an efficient, fair, and transparent securities market in which investors and the integrity of the market are protected. And we intend to stick with this charge. We intend to go full steam ahead. We're not going to stop. We're not going to dither. And there'll be no flip-flopping. And we want that 
to that message to get out there so that we together can build the kind of system that we'll all be proud of, that would sponsor and trigger and fuel economic growth and development. So I believe that this session would be useful. Um, and let me also say that we don't intend this to be the first and last. Uh, we would like to en continue engaging um, with you so that from time to time, uh, we can give you the information that will also help you to assist us to ensure that we have a securities industry that is working well and that is achieving the uh, desired goals. I'm happy to say that after the cleanup, uh, we have dealt with a lot of the challenges in the system. The stage has been set to consolidate on the cleanup. So we need to uh, keep our eyes on the ball and not to allow you know, a, a fall back into those um, you know, times of bad behavior. And that's why uh, we are keen on engaging you and the general investing public so that we have um, a securities industry that we are happy and proud of. So thank you for coming. And uh, I wish all of us a very successful time here this morning. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Reverend Daniel Bamitete, the chairman of the event and the director general of the Securities and Exchange Commission. At this juncture, we would also like to acknowledge a very important person in our midst. We have the Assistant Commissioner of Police and also the Deputy Director General of the CID, Mr. Frederick Kojo AJ. Can you be upstanding, please? Thank you. I have an additional tax for Mr. AJ. I would like to welcome you to the podium to give us your remarks. Shall we welcome him, please? Please, let's keep clapping till he comes here. Let's keep clapping till he gets to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning to you all. And let me stand on the existing protocols. Um, it is indeed an honor to be here and to be part of this investor education program being organized by Security and Exchange Commission dubbed time with SEC. Uh, colleague officers, ladies and gentlemen, I'm aware we have Yoko officers as well as FIC here. Is that correct? Very well. Um, the primary and chiefly duty of the Criminal Investigations Department is to investigate crimes by applying conventional and scientific methods of evidence gathering to detect and apprehend criminals and present them and the evidence for prosecution. This responsibility cannot be effectively discharged without, among other things, constantly building the capacity of investigators to combat traditional and emerging crimes, as well as deepening the cooperation with other law enforcement and regulatory agencies like SEC. It is against this backdrop that the CID is very excited and welcomes this opportunity to spend time with SEC with a view to better understand SEC's role as a regulator in the security industries and capital markets. Equally, um, I trust SEC will also leverage this platform to appreciate the CID's mandate and activities. Colleague officers, ladies and gentlemen, the Security Industry Act 2016 Act 929 is the law premise upon which SEC operates. And if you look at sections 147 to section 153 of the said act, it spells out some of the offenses that may be committed within the trading and securities industry. It is the expectation of the CID administration that by the close of today's interaction, you will have a better perspective of the security industry Again, an understanding of the crimes that may be committed within the industry, as well as the investigative techniques and tools that may be utilized to investigate such crimes, gather evidence, and apprehend offenders for prosecution. And as Chair said, to punish offenders. I will therefore entreat all of you to give your maximum attention and participation to today's engagement contribute to the discussions and ask questions so that you will live here with the competencies to effectively investigate crimes committed in the industry. 
Let me quickly remind you that whatever you learn here today is not for your exclusive consumption. Remember, you were selected among many for this program. I will therefore implore you to share the knowledge you acquire with your colleagues and apply same in your work. To conclude, let me once again thank SEC for this opportunity to deepen the partnership between our two agencies. We hope for more of such interactions. And to my colleague officers, let's continue to work hard to reduce crime to the barest minimum and make Ghana safer. Thank you. I'm sure we can give him another round of applause. So very important things stated in his speech, the importance of deepening the capacity of implementing institutions, the need to make sure the ties that lie between LEAs and the SEC are also deepened. And also, we also take the opportunity to appreciate the mandate of the CID. At this juncture, I'd like to also invite the Deputy Executive Director in charge of monitoring and intelligence from Yoko, Mrs. Abba Jacqueline Opoku, to give her her additional remarks. Shall we welcome her, please? Shall we welcome her? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. As usual, I will stand on all the protocols that have gone before so that I'll just give a few remarks this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be with you at this particular program that I found that the Securities and Exchange Commission is, as we have heard, an institution set up for a particular purpose. The role set out in its law states that its object is to regulate and promote the growth and development of an efficient, fair, and transparent securities market in which the investors, the investors, it may be you and I or people we know, as well as the integrity of the market is protected. What is a capital market? Why should it be of interest? How does it concern a country like Ghana? When we look at a place like Malaysia, like Singapore, which happened to gain their independence in proximate time to Ghana, they all started from a certain format. But within a period, because of their focus and the fact that they had a security sector interested in promoting capital market and other investment areas, they have moved so far ahead that Ghana, which used to be called the Switzerland of Africa, today we are lagging far behind. We are lagging far behind. So if somebody is interested in putting the funds or the money that they have available to use so that it can develop Accra, it can develop Zabzugu Tatale, it can create industries and jobs for us. Look at the situation in which we are with COVID, where it was an effort to even get the nose mask that we need to use. There are things which is critical for a capital market to be able to do, and it depends on us as law enforcement agencies, who all have a mandate in part to disseminate the information that comes to our knowledge so our general public will be well informed to take appropriate decisions in terms of investment and also to draw attention when people fall by the wayside and decide to do or carry out activities which will go contrary to what we all expect and look forward to. The Economic and Organized Crime Office, as we know, was set up by an Act of Parliament in 2010, and our objects include to prevent and to detect criminal activity in addition to which we are mandated to take action against any criminal activity by preparing our dockets after our prosecutions, which we do in collaboration with other law enforcement agencies as mandated again in our law. For capital injection, I view this as an infusion 
of blood. We know people who have been ill. I want to really draw it into a practical section for us to understand and appreciate that. It is critical for us as law enforcement to ensure that the Securities and Exchange Commission is able to carry out its mandate, is able to implement and structure and ensure that we will have the best capital market on this continent, which will be a go-to for the entire world. So if the capital market creates an infusion of the lifeblood, which is money, finances, to establish businesses, to build long-term projects, our roads, our railways, our various things that a country needs, without that kind of capital, it will take you so long to be able to get to the place that you need to as a nation. So it is a laudable position. It is something that we all need to rally together to support. The Economic and Organized Crime Office has a scope of going further to engage with the CID, the FIC. We, we know that we have had engagements and even at a recent program, that was also a time with the Securities and Exchange Commission where issues concerning the failed um, banking sector and more um, microfinance and savings and loans institutions, which we've all heard about. We all know somebody who has been impacted by the consequences or outcomes of those decisions taken by certain officers in those agencies. I was able to draw out that EOCO had went on a number of dockets which had been prepared and submitted to the Office of the Attorney General for prosecution. So apart from our investigations, the dockets still need to go through a process. If we are better informed and we are able to also bring this information to the knowledge of the judiciary and the other players in the chain of law enforcement, we will find that everyone will play their part to ensure that at the end of the day, any miscreants are punished, it will be unattractive to go into this area. For IOKO, our public education unit is also out in the media, engaging with the media, and putting information out that everyone is responsible to at least ensure you do a modicum of due diligence to, uh, to, to be certain that somebody who is promising you that they will multiple your money and give you a thousand percent worth in four weeks, maybe telling you a story that's too good to be true. So I would like to just add that over the years, IOKO together with the Securities and Exchange Commission and some of the agencies represented here, FIC and the Ghana Police Service under the Criminal Investigations Department, CID, have worked together to bring confidence to the investor public. I think some of the work that we have done so far has given a modicum of respite to the investors who are still looking forward to recovering their money. So I would ask and entreat that each and every one of us, we focus on this program. We listen attentively. We ask questions. And even go ahead to take the opportunity to do some networking with our colleagues in this room so that by the end of this program, we'll be well positioned to put our best foot forward and ensure that the theme for this program, the role of the Securities and Exchange Commission in the capital market will be fulfilled. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deputy Executive Director in charge of monitoring and intelligence of Yoko, Mrs. Abba Opoku. Um, at this juncture, before we even continue, I'd like to state a few things. would encourage all of you to keep your phones off on silent so we don't have any interruptions. In case you need to use the bathroom, you can come through the exit on the left or just behind. The emergency exit is just behind us and um, we look forward to your cooperation as far as these few guidelines are concerned. Um, at this juncture, I would also like to invite the Deputy Director General for Legal of the SEC, Mrs. Deborah Ajimfra, and she is going to further underscore 
the importance of such partnerships with the LEA. So, shall we welcome Mrs. Ajimfra? I think we can do it better. The energy cannot go down now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. All protocols observed. I think it's very good, encouraging to see how full the room is and how on time people were this morning. So after all the very good remarks we've had, I'll just want to highlight a few things. Essentially, as has been said, the act of the SEC, the Securities Industry Act, Act 929, gave room for the role of the role and um, for the role of the law enforcement agencies because we have fines in our act, but we also have conviction. And the SEC does not have the power to convict anyone would have to depend on the law enforcement agencies to do that investigation before the attorney general can prosecute and then we can have a conviction. So those who actually drafted the act were very sure about this and knew that some things will be done in the capital market space that will require a conviction to send the right signal. And we forwarded some cases to the Attorney General recently, and he wrote back to tell us that let Iyoko or CID carry out an investigation, and they would advise us. I think those were some of the cases that were highlighted. So how do we work with the law enforcement agencies? I think the entry point to the capital market is key. So when we get applications for directors and people who would work in our space, we actually write to CID to do a background check on these people because we need to know the people that are coming into our space. And when they finish coming into our space, we actually supervise them. They don't just operate without supervision. So in the process of the supervision, if we find out that's anything that we require assistance from the law enforcement agencies, our law actually specifies that in cases of searches, requests for documents, questioning of people, we can use the police. So the law gives us that right to actually go to the police and say, these people are obstructing us, can you assist us in this process? So the entry point is key. As we carry on the businesses with these companies and we supervise them, we come to the law enforcement agencies to also assist. And at the unfortunate point where we have to revoke licenses, we still need the law enforcement agencies because we've had to lock up some companies, we've had to go and get some documents from their offices, and then there's a process going on, as the DG said, the revocation exercise has been very expensive. So after the state has been able to provide the funds up front, how do we get the money from the people who have not used the money in the right way? There has to be some investigation for the money to be recouped to the state. It is not free money that is being given out to the investors. So that is for the licensed entities. Then the big challenge we are also having is unlicensed entities. And that is also affecting the confidence in the capital market. Because some people don't know the difference between the licensed and the unlicensed. And I want to say Yoko collaborated very well with the SEC in relation to CHY Mall, which was a recent case this year. As we released our statement, and Yoko also released the statement on the same company, they realized that this is not just a fine or an administrative issue, it can lead to people being imprisoned. And that ended the activities to the best of our knowledge of this company. So the collaboration is very key. And CID also comes to us when they see some of these unlicensed entities. Just to clear their minds, they write to us and ask, is this entity licensed by the SEC or not? before they start taking actions on them. So the level of engagement has been very good. And one thing that has also come up regularly is the use of trust accounts for operational purposes. So the fund managers are supposed to have accounts that are just for the investors. Unfortunately, some of them use them to pay salaries, to buy vehicles, to do things that they were not supposed to do. So we've had to depend on law enforcement to really find out how the money in the accounts were used. That's also been useful. And DG also talked about capital raising, and Madame from Yoko also said it. If we raise capital and the businesses we have expand, 
employment will be created. And it's clear that there's a link between unemployment and the crime rate. Of course, there's greed also that is not linked to it. But then there's also the fact that unemployment is linked to the crime rate. And if we all work together and these businesses are able to raise capital, the confidence is high, businesses will expand, people will get more jobs. And in addition to that, we have to be alive to invest. And so if the crime rate goes down, armed robbery goes down, people are protected, more people will be alive to invest. So it is clear that without the law enforcement agencies, the SEC cannot carry out its mandate, investors will not have confidence, and our economy will not grow the way it should. So I hope that at the end of this training program today, we'll learn how to collaborate more and make sure that these things happen in our economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Ajinfra, Deputy Director General of the SEC. At this juncture, I would like to unpack the theme. The theme says the role of the SEC in a capital market. I believe that understanding the role of the SEC in a capital market means also understanding the workings of the SEC in terms of its mandate, appreciating its governance structure. Uh, have an understanding or insight about the kind of units and departments we have and what their mandate is. We'll but also look at uh, the strategy of the SEC and for us what success looks like. So to do justice to this part of the presentation will be Mr. Paul Abelbu, the Deputy Director General for Finance of the SEC. Shall we welcome him very warmly? For law enforcement agencies, I'm expecting you have more power in your hands to clap. Can we do it better? All right, thank you. It's time for you. The floor is yours. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, Mr. Chairman, Deputy DG of SEC, um, DG of the CID, all protocols observed, if I may proceed. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and I think since we took office, we've made it our goal to really strengthen the relationship we have uh, with, with our law enforcement agencies. Because when people see SEC, sometimes they think we are even a security company. You know, they hear security, security. I'm one of more securities than that. And I said, yes, you're a security company, but we deal with securities. Um, so this morning, um, I will borrow a methodology for my C CEO, Reverend Daniel Bamitete, by giving you an acronym, which will be a theme you'll see in the presentation. Because we are dealing with CID, and as I was looking at my notes, I thought of confidence, confidence, information, and dependency. Um, when we talk of confidence, you want to have confidence in public security, confidence in the state, confidence in the arms of government confidence that the laws will work as they are supposed to. Then we talk about information. You need information. What do you do? Where do you find the information? Who do you talk to? How do you solve problems? And problems will arise, just that we don't want to resolve to conflict when it comes to resolving the problem. So you need information on how you even resolve conflict. Then dependency. So there are dependencies in the system. We are all in this country. And as we say, if we have to have peace, we all have to agree that uh, we'll solve our problems in, in a mutually satisfactory way. So we need predictability. Uh, we need to be able to plan. If you are looking at capital market, we're talking about long-term financing. So we need a dependable base framework. In world torn company countries, you'll, you won't find a stock market. We won't be sitting here if there are people fighting um, outside of Ghana, uh, outside of this room. So. Those are highlights, and it ties into what we do at SEC as well. Uh, because under SEC, we have what we call um, the IOSCO, um, International Organization of Securities Commissioners. And they have three broad purposes for securities regulation. One is investor protection, which is to say that one, the investors need to have enough information to make decisions. 
there has to be a due process to deal with investor issues, and there has to be a mechanism for resolving investor challenges, so a resolution framework. And I think if you see how that ties into the C, that confidence in the system, the investors need to feel like they're protected. If there's a problem, it can be solved. And then we also have what we call uh, developing a, a fair and efficient and transparent market. Now, for capital markets, and one of the issues that we have seen, oh, my slides are not moving. I don't know. If okay. So. I'm on the three points at the last point, so, um, okay, I'll proceed. Let's go to the IOSCO slide. Okay, so I've talked about price discovery. In securities markets, you don't have the ability to discover prices. So I'm talk about a fair market. Um, and I think we give the example of, uh, a company promising you a thousand percent. It means that that company has some information that nobody else has to generate that kind of return. Now if they are monopoly, let's say ECG, and you have to buy electricity, you can understand that. But ECG as a monopoly is not generating a thousand percent. So what information do investors have? And is it a fair market? Is the person withholding information? Um, is, is there efficiency? Right, so part of capital markets is to increase efficiency, which is the role of intermediation. We facilitate intermediation. So those who have capital, if they want to invest, do they have to go and buy the assets themselves or can they find professionals who help them to acquire the assets? And then when they want to sell the asset, how do they sell it? If selling, and I think we've all dealt with selling a car or selling your, phone, your old phone, you have to find someone who wants that same phone. And sometimes that takes a while because there's no transparent market for that asset. However, on the capital markets, if you want to sell a share, there's a price on the stock exchange, and we'll get into those details later, where you can find that this is the price of the share. Now you have to find who is willing to buy it at that price. Maybe you have to lower the price before it can be sold. And then there's also some what we call risk allocation. So part of the efficiency is to ensure that uh, the risk in the system, somebody wants to take more risk. Do they appreciate the risk of what they are doing? Uh, sometimes the business is very risky. In, in the capital markets, we ensure that people are aware of the level of risk that they are taking. Uh, and then we also want to reduce friction. Friction. So money, as we say, moves around. Now, if there's friction, the cost of moving money goes higher. Um, and so when you have a market that is efficient, money is able to change hands without too much friction. That's why we're going to a cashless economy, because when you're doing cash, and say you're buying um, a house, and you want to spend 200,000 cities to buy a house, and you have to carry cash, between where your bank and where you get the house, the, the landlord himself, that's one problem. The transfer of the title to your name is another problem. Now, the parallel would be the equivalent of what we call, we've developed a product called REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust. These are investment companies that invest in real estate. So instead of buying a house, you could buy a share in a REIT. Now, a REIT is trades on a stock exchange. So when you want to sell your house, you go on the phone and you say, sell my REIT share for 200,000 CDs. Just think of that friction. Think of the ease of transaction. Um, so these are examples. And I think there was an example that I saw recently in the news. In one country, um, I forget the name, but they, there was a problem with their fixed income market. And so they deal in cash. So if you want to buy government bonds, I think it was Afghanistan actually, you take, you take cash from the bank, then you go to your broker and you give him the cash. Then he'll give you a note and say you have the government bond. In Ghana, if you want to buy a government bond, you can either go to your bank or your broker dealer's online app and you place your order. So that's what we call efficiency. Um, then we could talk about transparency. So information transparency. Do you know what's going on? Um, then the last point is systemic risk. On systemic risk, 
we are part of what we call the Financial Stability Council. Um, so before we had an MOU, we called the Regulators Forum, but that was slightly informal. We've created a formal platform, just as we're trying to create a formal platform with law enforcement agencies. But we sit with other regulators, because you often find that people find gaps and then they occupy that space. Uh, innovation tends to find that gap as well, but as you've seen, there are some principles. So even if you're occupying that space, you have to do, apply those principles and ensure that people know what's going on. Then on systemic risk, we also have to think of security issues, right? Because if people are losing their money, um, and we all heard of Piram in the 90s, in the 80s, those things can cause a security issue in the real world. So if financial sector problems can roll forward by creating unemployment, by creating a, a sense of instability, so that people feel like they can take their law into their own hands and do whatever they want uh, without any consequences. So when we take our actions, it's also to ensure that the system remains stable and dependent. And then the other element really of systemic risk is you also, you also want to be able to create wealth and, and, and preserve it, right? So a, a young man starts his company, runs it for 50 years, he's 75, and he wants to transition to the next generation a lot of times when the old person is dying, then either unscrupulous people come and give him a loan or come and take his money, then you find that at the end of life, the transition of wealth from one generation to the other gets dissipated. And for communities in, in America and in Ghana, oftentimes the minority community, the, the black people, we tend to suffer from this issue. Um, that's because we also don't trust the system. The system often is not built, we say, not for us. Uh, but we have to own our market we have to ensure that we have that dependency built into the system and that we can transfer wealth uh, when the time comes. We can move on now. I'm going to skip through the remaining slides. We wanted to focus on these issues, I think, are where we tend to interface with the law enforcement agencies. Now I'll talk briefly about the commission and how we try and achieve these objectives. We can move to the next one. Okay. So our, our, our vision really is to be a top tier securities market regulator. And honestly, as a regulator, we rely on you. We rely on what you do, both on a day-to-day -day basis, but also how you interface with us um, to, to act. So we can only achieve this when we have a good partnership with the security agencies. Our, our mission is to regulate and innovate and promote the growth and development of an efficient, fair and transparent securities market in which investors and the integrity of the market are protected. We have four main uh, values that we live by, and that is team spirit, respect, innovation, and then commitment. In terms of our structure, we have an 11 member commission, um, and then under that we have um, four main committees. We have the approvals and licensing committee. So when we get licensed applications, we process and we send it to our board and they sit on it. They have the administrative hearings committee. So the administrative hearings committee is actually required by law. When people have complaints, when they are happy with decisions that have been taken at the commission, they can apply for a hearing. And that is part of the idea of transparency and fairness. And then we have the finance and administration committee that deals with admin stuff. Then we have the property committee, which has been merged uh, with the finance and admin committee now. We, the commission has three executive members, so myself, DDGL, and DG. We have the Ministry of Finance represented. We have Bank of Ghana represented. We have the Institute of Chartered Accountants. We have Registrar General, and then the General Legal Council. And we also ensure that we have gender balance on the commission. Now, operationally, how are we structured? So there's the Deputy Director General, there's the Director General, who is the head of the Institute. Then we have the Audit and Risk Team. Um, they have a dotted line into the DG, but also report to the board, and they also interface with the Audit Committee, which is a subcommittee of the board. Um, the Risk Team also handles anti-money laundering issues and counter-terrorism finance and matters. Under the Deputy Director General, we have the Exchanges and Markets, we have human resource and administration, policy research and IT, legal and enforcement. Then under Deputy Director General Finance, which is myself, we have the finance unit, we have the issuers unit, then we have fund managers, 
and then um, broker dealers and advisors. Then under the Office of the Director General itself, we also have um, the company secretary and then international relations. You can see that SEC has transformed over the past, say, three to four years. And that means that we also need to change the structure in which we deliver our mandate. So we've done some work on our structure. Uh, as we roll forward, uh, you'll see it in the next, maybe the next interaction we have, we'll show you the new structure as formulated. Okay. Overall, we, we try and have some kind of gender balance. So we have some males and some females, so 40, 21, and 2017. In June, it was 46, 22, but I think it's, it's been rebalanced again. So when we update this, you'll see that we're a small entity. Um, at last check, we're around 78 or so. Uh, we've hired some new people since, since our last go around. We can move on. Okay. So I've talked briefly on the principles of it, but the law itself, Act 929, um, gives us some core mandates. So regulating the capital markets is one, and that involves developing and implementing, okay, implementing new acts, regulations, guidelines, and directives. So even when you go on our website, we put some of the guidelines we develop up there. Every time we do a new guideline, we publicize it for comments. And that's part of the efficiency or the transparency that we need to see in the securities market. And then we also advise the minister on policy. Um, so government wants to do 1D1F, for instance. How do people raise money for their factories? Is the government going to fund it? If the government is funding it, it has fiscal implications. If private people are going to do it, what is the state of capital raising? How do they raise capital? And does a regulator create a framework to allow for that? Uh, we didn't do any change when government came out from this initiative because our rules as it stands now already enables the creation of capital, enables the raising of money by enterprises for their purposes. Then we have financial stability. I think I've mentioned that already. I've talked about market development and then investor protection. Okay, I've talked briefly at, about sustainable financial stability. So here again, you, uh, my colleague Deborah mentioned the, the bailout. So we monitor the solvency of license holders. And there's another issue that became evident that besides solvency, you may have assets, but you may not have liquidity. And I think we've seen my first job. Um, there was a, a gentleman who came to our office in a Ferrari and my boss told me, this guy is broke because the car he's holding, he's borrowed. He doesn't have a CD on it. I was in America then. He doesn't have a dollar to his name. He's broke. You see him in his house, in his car. If today something happens to him. So he has assets. And maybe his borrowing is less than the assets he has. But that's some liquidity. So liquidity can be an issue. Somebody can have assets. A company may have assets but they don't have liquidity. So they're unable to pay people when it comes due. And oftentimes, that's what you'll find when we talk about Ponzi schemes, that they, they gather assets, but they don't have liquidity. They're unable to pay. And that, that's an issue. So we also monitor that as well. And I also monitor the integrity of the market. So it's information being shared. Are you giving people the right information? Because people may want to go into uh, maybe an agric business, but do they know that the soil that you're farming in Tamale is, is clay soil? Right? Maybe there's been 10 harvests there which the yield was 10%. If they don't know that and you tell them, oh, the yield is 100%, so you are deceiving them. And that is something that the law enforcement agency should be involved in. That was, was fraudulent and defrauding by false pretenses because the person knew information that did not disclose to the participants in the scheme. We can move on. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. So we also deal with an ecosystem, as I mentioned. Uh, we have the Bank of Ghana I work with. There's what we call the Ghana Securities Industry Association, which is an industry body uh, made up of all the market operators. So when we need to do consultations, sometimes we also invite them for consultations. And I think as we build a relationship, we also bring them onto this platform in subsequent interactions. There's the Ghana Stock Exchange, and my colleague Jacob will speak about their role more extensively. And then there's the Central Securities Depository. 
Um, and here, our, our securities in Ghana are dematerialized. So when you buy a bond, in the example I gave earlier, you don't need to hold a paper that says, I'm holding a bond. You, your shares are recognized in the depository. And what you get is an email or a confirmation that you have the security. And you can trade it without the physical interaction. That's, that's the stock exchange, the depository, working together to enable that. You have the Ghana Commodity Exchange, uh, which trades commodities. So now in Ghana, you can trade um, rice, corn, sesame seed on the commodity exchange without necessarily owning the physical asset. Um, and that's, that's a big innovation, even though not too much, because it takes a while for a market to pick up. Uh, but it's a big intervention on agric because Ghana is an agricultural economy, whether we like it or not. And so agric needs to have a space in the capital market. And we see the commodity exchange playing a big role in that. We interface with the NPRA a lot as well. The pension fund managers are actually fund managers licensed by SEC. That NPRA then subsequently gives the license to. They also use custodians. And the custodians are also licensed by SEC primarily and then they rely on our license to give them a subsequent license. So the only player in the pension space that we don't regulate is the trustees. They are the National Insurance Commission. Um, so there, for instance, the insurance companies are listed on our market. Insurance products often rely on a the portfolio. They have to invest in securities before they can give you insurance. At the time they need to pay, they need to have the assets. So how are those assets managed? How are they held? and how are they transferred when they need liquidity. Okay, other service providers we have are accountants, auditors, lawyers, uh, valuation experts, consultants, and software providers. So briefly, in terms of what we regulate, I've mentioned the stock market, we have the bond market, which is the Ghana fixed income market, we have the commodity market, we have money markets, we don't necessarily regulate money markets directly, but oftentimes you have collective investment schemes that play in the money markets. And some of our market operators also invest in what we call commercial paper, which are short-term instruments that pay a fixed return. You have a derivatives market. Um, in Ghana, that is now emerging. The new companies act that was passed created space for what we call uh, settlement, netting of agreements. So if I owe you and you owe me, at the point of default, we don't have to change money. We can just say, okay, net of my 100,000 and your 90,000, the net is 10,000, and that closes the trade. So for complex transactions, you don't need to move so much money back and forth. Imagine that, and it sounds like there's a lot of trade going on, but net net is the same money changing hands. So derivatives markets is something that we are looking at for the next phase of our development. Okay. In terms of our strategy, we focus on education. So we see this as an educational opportunity, but also see it as developing the relationship with um, our law enforcement agencies. Um, enforcement, we are very keen to enforce our laws. Um, and I think if you notice what we've been doing the past few years, we've been educating the public about what we do as a regulator overall. Okay, we can go on. So some of the new products we have issued recently, I've talked about commodity exchange. We've done the real estate investment trust. The investment guidance for managers has actually gone out now, so it's no longer draft. Then we have private funds. So we have what we call private equity. When people want to buy unlisted companies. Not everybody deals in the listed company. The unlisted companies, and most companies are actually unlisted. So sometimes your friend comes to you, so I need money for my business. You are giving him private capital. How do you register that interest? Maybe you should go to RGD, Registrar General, and say, I'm owning 10% of this company. Because if tomorrow the company starts to become a 100 million CD company, now you gave him 1,000 CDs five years ago, he won't mind you, he's not picking your calls because he's making 100 million CDs. And you've lost, you gave him a loan for free. And it wasn't a loan, you knew that it, could, it was money at risk. So those are considerations. And disputes arise out of that. I'm not sure if you guys deal with that, but as the economy becomes richer, People will find that, oh, there's an IT company that has now become big and they, they didn't treat employees well. And what is their recourse? If they say, oh, we'll have a share scheme for you. How are those shares treated? SEC has oversight of some of those kinds of transactions as well. Okay, so I've, I've gone through a bit, but I think we've, we've done justice to the topic. 
And I think this is introductory. So as you explore our website, as you engage with us subsequently, you also find out more. Um, but we expect to see that as a regulator, uh, we'll have an enhanced status. Um, it's a point of pride for us management that we invited you and you also came. <laughs> that in itself shows that in Ghana, we have a good relationship with the securities agencies. We want to see growth in listings and market capitalization. Um, Ghana is a peaceful country. We have a stable democracy. So our market does not reflect the strength of our economy. If you look around West Africa, and even if you go to a crown mall, you see all kinds of people coming to Ghana to shop, to have their vacation, to buy houses, because they know that here there's stability. Uh, so our market needs to reflect that same th characteristics. We want to see greater liquidity, and then the exchanges also should be thriving, and then the new products, because as we sit here, even though some of you may say, well, I'm not in the capital market, your pension funds, your SNIT, is in the capital market. SNIT is one of the biggest investors in our capital markets. Um, and now the pension funds we have also invest in the capital market. So we are all players. Once you are paying taxes, once you are in Ghana, even government of Ghana, when they go and borrow, their bonds come and, uh, are come, uh, listed on the stock market, on the fixed income market for trading. And then we also want to see well capitalized market operators. The entities that we regulate should be strong, they should be able to operate well, and they should operate credibly. Literacy is key nationwide. So as we started our engagements, I think you saw us go to Takrade. We want to go to Kumase, we want to go to other regions, and encourage people to understand one, what the regulator does, what the capital markets are, how to appreciate risks that they take, and what we say is an informed investor is a protected investor. So giving them the information to make their decision is key. Okay. I think I'll end my presentation here. Uh, there'll be time for, for questions and answers. But to wrap up, again, confidence, information, and depend. Can we all say it together? Confidence, information, dependency. Iyoko, next time we interact, I'll come up with an acronym for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Confidence, information, and dependency. Looks like we are getting a new acronym for the CID. Uh, hopefully the original will still stay. So quite a robust um, presentation there. As the presenter indicated, there will be an opportunity to ask questions during the open forum. So please make sure that you write your questions down. This program has been organized for you to enhance and deepen your understanding of the SEC and uh, bilaterally as well. So moving on to the second part of the presentation, we began with the A, which is understanding the role of the SEC or the SEC itself. Within the theme, we have the capital market. It's important to understand the industry and we have Dr. Jacob Edu, who will like, enhance our understanding of the securities industry. He's the director at the SEC and the head of the issuers department. Can we have him very quickly? Thank you. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, and all other protocols observed. So we are going to do an overview of the capital market and especially how the law enforcement agencies fit in, or how two of us would have to collaborate to ensure a market that has integrity and in which investors will feel uh, very much protected. So the SEC, as we've been told, is the apex regulator of the capital market, or the securities market, and by that, it looks after all players or all institutions, persons, and agencies who do business in the capital market. Can you proceed to the next slide? Yes. So the capital market, I think over here, Mr. Sopoku did a lot of my job for me. So I don't intend to keep so much time here. See, you all know what a market is. A market is a place where buyers and sellers meet or a place where we buy and sell. And so if you talk about the capital market, we are talking about the financial market, the long-term end of the market, where people who have excess funds, monies, we call them surplus units, 
meet those who need those monies. We call them the deficit units. Meet to exchange these funds. And what these monies do is to enable those who need the monies, who are essentially companies, enable them to get the money to invest in their factories, to invest in planting machinery, to construct roads in terms of infrastructure, hospitals. Actually, it is not only private companies that play on the capital market. Government also does. If you hear government issuing euro bonds, government is operating on the, on the capital market. And the monies that come to finance these projects, these businesses and activities, come from pension funds, insurance funds, collective investment schemes, banks, as well as individuals. In fact, even when we mention pension funds and insurance companies, the money is actually money from individuals. So ultimately, the individual is the beneficiary of the capital market. You have to work and generate the money. Then you give it to this farm managers manage on your behalf. And as part of their management, they invest in these assets. And then they get your return in the end. So as the economy develops, you must also have some returns for your hard work. It is also a mechanism through which institutions and individuals can invest surplus funds. That's what I've already said. I mean, we are here to, to work and to enjoy the, 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 the fruit of our labor. So that is what we have in simple terms. This lab is just to distinguish between the capital market and the money market. You see, we have segments of the market. Until recently, if I want onions, I know I have to go to Aboblochi. But now I have to go to Central Region somewhere or in some somewhere. If you want yam, you know where to go to buy yam. Yam market is there. Timber, you know where to go. So the money market is the is the short end aspect of the financial market, where short term investments and with maturity not exceeding one year are traded. So if you buy treasurables, you are putting in the in the of of up to one year versus four operating in the money market. If you buy six months, three months, you are still in the money market. You also have money market mutual funds. They are funds that are licensed by the CC, but their investments are in the short term and the market. So such mutual funds, which are money market funds, actually invest in treasurables and other instruments up to a period of one, one year. It's not only individuals who invest in I mean, the money market. We have, especially the banks, especially, because you know banks carry money, huge sums of monies at the end of each day. And banks will not allow money to lie idle. So where they foresee that they have money in excess of what they need, overnight, they look for another bank that needs the money. They will lodge it with them. They feel that they come for it. And so banks, Will be, will, be, will be placing their, their short-term funds with their colleague banks and also even with the central bank. We have CPs, companies also issue commercial papers. They are, I mean, instruments where the, 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 the companies own you for providing them with, with short-term funding for their businesses. So these are a few of the things. And in the money market, what we can bear in mind is that Safety is, is actually on the very high side, liquidity. And because you have liquidity, you have safety, and low risk, your return there is, is very low. Because the higher the risk, the higher the return. So if you want 90 days, it's easy, pretty easy to predict within 90 days than to predict in, in three years or seven years. So the longer the uncertainty, the reward is a high return if everything should go well. Let's continue. So both the money market and the capital market are, are, are regulated by the SEC. Of course, BUG, which is the Bank of Ghana, regulates the banks. But our licensees actually use the instruments that the banks issue, fixed deposit tables and all that. So we, we work together. Another distinction I may want to bring to our attention is what we call the primary market and the secondary market. 
in the primary market, governments and companies obtain financing by selling either equity or debt securities. And in the primary market, the company or the government who sells the securities is the one who receives the proceeds. So if you hear that, uh, let's say, ADB was issuing shares and went and bought some, the money you pay for the shares that you've bought go to ADB directly and it uses to do its business. In the same way, if you, you as an existing shareholder, you want to get out of ADB, you see, you don't have to go to ADB and tell the MD that the shares are bought, please take it back and give me my money, no. You don't want the capital of these institutions to be disturbed. So in order to ensure that there is stability in the capital that the company should operate with, if you want to sell your shares, you go and look for a broker who is licensed by SEC and also licensed by the GSC, Canada kind of Stock Exchange, to take your shares and sell it on your behalf so that the company wouldn't have to look for money to pay you. What happens in the secondary market is that if Mr. A bought ADB shares, now he wants to get out. Mr. A will look for a broker. The broker will look for somebody, say, let's say Mr. X, who wants to buy. So the broker will be in the middle, will sell your shares, Mr. A's shares to Mr. X. And then the new shareholder, or the person who buys it now, becomes the shareholder of ADB. The first person who goes out. So in the secondary market, proceeds for shares do not go to the company. It gets to the, the new investor, the new shareholder. Whilst in the primary market, the money that you pay for shares goes to the company for, for its business. So that's the essential difference between the primary market and the secondary market. Just a little bit more on the secondary market here. The GSC or the Ghana Stock Exchange has some powers in regulating the trading activities on the stock exchange. So they are the first level regulators of the market. We also call them they are, they are self-regulatory organization. But overall, it is the SEC that is ultimately responsible for the regulation of, of the market. So in case a market, market abuse is detected, or a manipulation is detected, which is, 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 is achieved through certain computer systems that the GSE and the SEC I mean, have installed. The SEC will then ask GSC, we have observed certain fluctuations in the market price of this company A or B. Of course, GSC too would have seen it. So they will start the investigation to find out whether the changes we see in the price of the shares are actually normal or abnormal. And of course, the SEC, if not satisfied with the investigations that will be done by the GSC, can also do investigation by itself. And ultimately, if the SEC suspects fraud or some criminal activity, these cases are normally referred to under the CID or the now NIB, BNI formerly, not the NIB bank, BNI, for, for further investigation. And that is why the need for collaboration between the SEC and the, and the law enforcement agencies are important to ensure that the integrity of the market is, is, is secured. Now, let's go back to, we are going back to the primary market. But before a company issues shares in the primary market, that company will have to submit what we call a prospectus, a document, to the SEC for approval. So SEC approves prospectus for all institutions apart from the government. 
uh, the government is overall, so we don't normally approve government uh, office. So an invitation to the public to acquire or dispose shares is actually in section 3041 of, of the Companies Act. And to sum up this, when you submit a proposal to the SEC, the SEC will have to make sure that it conforms with the company's code provisions. The SEC approved the proposal for you. Then you can then go out to make the invitation to the public to subscribe for your shares or the benches. In addition, see the companies, the act itself says that every function that the company's code has conferred on the commission has to be performed. So when it comes to how to approve it to the public, the SEC uses its own laws and also uses the, the, the company's act, which is Act 922. Please go on. Yes. So, what is the implication of, of this Section 304 of Act 992 on the capital market? If you read it carefully, you observe that a private company cannot make an invitation to the public to subscribe for its shares or debentures. We also see that there must always be a prospectus, because that is the document that you will use to assess the, 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 the soundness of the investment that we are making. And this prospectus have to be approved by the SEC and a copy delivered to the Register General before the offer will start. And even if you had the prospectus approved, the offer or the invitation must take place within six months. So you see the, the, the responsibility that, that we all have on our hands. If you hear that somebody is selling shares, the first question is whether it's a public company, it has a product that is approved by the SEC, or whether the offer is within six months of that approval. If that or those things do not happen, then there's a problem with that, that, that offering. And if that offer or the issuer is sent to the law enforcement agencies, then that is what that issuer deserves. Going on, we, we have another section of the Companies Act, which is Section 75D, which says that a private company, other than a company limited by guarantee, by virtue of its constitution, prohibits the company from making invitation to the public to deposit money for fixed periods or payable at a call, whether by interest or not. But if you look at section four of the act also, I mean, certain institutions, like the banks and the insurance and the others, mm, are not affected by this, by this uh, provision. So what it means is that if you are not a bank, insurance company, or licensed by the SEC, and you are also not a public company, and you start announcing that people should bring money and come and deposit with you. Under what authority are you inviting those people? You are an illegal entity. And that is what we, we see some of the times. People who don't have any, any, any standing are boosting the market with their products. And so you have the responsibility again as law enforcement agencies, just as the SEC does, too scan the market to actually authenticate whether people who are asking to come and deposit money, if I not buying enough shares, who oh, come and give me whatever you have. Every month I'll give you 10%. Some of them have no basis to be doing that. Let's look at participants in the capital market. I think Mr. Abibu just mentioned them. We have the stock exchange, we have the SEC as the regulator, we have investment advisors, we have investors, as you have mentioned, we have issuers, be it companies or government, and there are others that we cannot mention all of them here. All these come together to make the capital market uh, workable. Please go on. 
See, these market intermediaries, as we saw them in the, in the last slide, are licensed by the SEC before they are allowed to operate in the market. And what they actually do is to intermediate between you who want to invest and where the investment will be placed. And there is a requirement that before we give them the license, they pass what you call the fit and proper person test of the SEC. And in order for us to be able to do this work well, we've been working with the CID. When I checked, we don't actually send them to the BNI and then the other agencies. What we ask them to do for us is to, to vet the, the character, the integrity of this person, at least at the entry point, where people can change along the line. But at the entry point, we want to be sure that we are not entrusting licenses into, into criminals and people who can easily plunge the capital market into, into danger. Please proceed. So how do we regulate the, the, the market? As I said, the starting point is licensing. That is the gate at which you enter the place. And so we want to make sure that people who enter the market have integrity, have necessary competence and experience, and all that. When somebody wants to issue shares or issue debentures, they have to come for approvals, supervision, Periodically, they send financial statements and reports for SEC to, to, to review and to advise. And, and, and sometimes, SEC also goes there. You have on-site and off-site. You go there and they submit the contract as well. Then you have enforcement. If people are found culpable, penalties are issued, suspensions are done, revocations, reprimand, disqualification means you, you'll be taken out of the market for a specified period of time. This is just a list of the open that we have. Probably you may be interested in the farm managers, the mutual funds, and all that. A lot of them, the, our website is also there if you want to deal in anything. Go there and check whether the people we are dealing with are licensed, at least. Please proceed. These are just uh, pictures, uh, proceed. Uh, pensions, and this, uh, let's say, this is the, the, the asset and the management of the industry. As of June, I mean, total assets under management was how much? 34 billion CDs. And we have 86 farm managers existing as at this point. Those are pictures illustrating what we've already mentioned. And because we don't have much time, I think we'll end here and wait for questions and answers session. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next presentation will examine two important things among others. We'll look at the legal and regulatory framework for enforcement actions and also regulatory tools for enforcement actions. So we have Mrs. Perpetua Yangsin, senior management with the Legal Enforcement Department of the SEC. Shall we please welcome her? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, good morning, all, and all protocols observed. Um, I stand here to make this presentation on behalf of uh, Mr. Kalis Badu, who is the head of legal. He's currently on leave, so unable to make it. Um, I'm talking about. You want me to use it? Okay. Um, yeah, so the outline of my presentation would we'll talk about the international and legal obligations, the regulatory framework, the regulatory tools and enforcement action, and then we'll go draw our conclusions. And we are not in isolation. It's a global village, as it is. And um, for our legal framework, we rely on our mother or our global mother organization, which is IOSCO, International Organization of Securities Commissions. And 
there are core objectives generally um, which binds, which has brought about some objective principles for which all international uh, securities commissions operate. Um, one is the protection of investors, ensuring that markets are fair, efficient, and transparent, and reducing systemic risk. So, um, our core object, we picked our core objectives also from the ISO, and then our local law or our legal framework. Um, the law gives us uh, section two, and that coordinates with what ISCO stands for. And we are talking about a fair, efficient, transparent market in which investors and the integrity of the market are protected. So um, in the same vein, the um, ISCO principles 1, 3, 13, and 14 tells us that we should have a clear and objective our, uh, our objectives must be clear, clearly stated. Our uh, responsibilities and objectives should be clearly stated. And in section 208 of our act, we are allowed to put out information that we consider necessary for the public. So this engagement is one of our um, obligations to put out the information out there so that the public would know what we do and understand it. Now, we are also able to establish information sharing mechanisms um, for domestic and foreign counterparts. And one of um, the measures that we have taken was to launch the capital market uh, plan, which was launched in May 2021. And one of the pillars, uh, that is pillar four, was to strengthen regulations, enforcement, and market confidence. And you'll agree with me that when, when the, the, there were revocations or when people's um, funds were, they couldn't assess their funds, there was some loss of confidence. However, the efforts that are being made by SEC to educate people to bring perpetrators to book would eventually build our market so that we'll build the confidence that we require. So. Um, as I said earlier, we need to um, we bring out information to the public as and when we think it is necessary. Now, I'll go to the regulatory framework in terms of our local laws. So, our mandate is given to us locally by the Securities Industries Act, which uh, was enacted, or the previous one was repealed. That was PNDC Law 333, and uh, it was um, enacted in 2016, and there has currently been an amendment, and that is 1062 um, in 2021. So um, what this law gives us is to give us the general framework and authorizations that the commission has. Now, under section 208 of our laws, we, we need, we can, um, we can have regulations because the law cannot have everything in spelled out. So we have regulations. Um, um, there's a LI 1728 as amended. We have the unit trust and mutual funds regulations. We have the SEC code and takeovers on takeovers and measures um, 2018. We have the compliance manual for broker dealers, investment advisors, and representatives. We have the Securities Industry and Licensing Guidelines 2020. We have the Security Industry Conduct of Business Guidelines 2020. We have the Securities Industry Financial Resources Guidelines 2020. We have the Securities and Exchange Commission Corporate Governance Code for listed companies. These are not exhaustive. They are additional ones. We, have, we issue guidelines from time to time, and they, are all, they can be found on our website. So that is uh, for the general uh, tools. Uh, so when we come to the actual tools for enforcement, so because we have the framework, we go by it um, as and when. And we, we have specific tools that we, we rely on. I'll run through it, and then the next slide, I'll go into detail. So we have the power to um, do a private warning or a public censure. Um, we have the power to, dis uh, uh, to disqualify um, licensees 
from holding license or becoming a, an officer of a licensee. We have the power to revoke, a revocation and suspension. We, have, um, we are able to give directives to the securities and securities exchange and uh, to individuals and to the market. We, we are, in fact, the prosecution's bit is quite, is quite, um, we, have, we, we don't have exact power to prosecute, but we, we can help to get prosecution done. That, that is where our prosecution's powers are. And then we can enter premises, we can freeze assets, we can freeze the uh, trust accounts, and then we, have, we can impose administrative penalties. So when we go into the detail, um, when we talk about private warnings and public censure, the section 123 gives us authorization where we think that um, the people in the market are not doing the right thing. We go into investigation and following the report result of our investigation, we have the power to, to issue a private warning or issue a public censure. So if you look at the revocations that were done, there was a publication to the public by the SEC. That is a public censure to tell the public what they have done and why their licenses have been revoked. We have a disqualification from the market. So where we think that, um, or I mean, through the investigations that we have done, we realize that the people are no longer fit and proper or the, the um, the market player is not going by the acts, then we can um, hold here currently for the, um, for the market players whose license were revoked. Uh, we are going further into investigating uh, the directors. We sent letters to about 101 directors in 34 liquidated companies. And in respect of the present, and past licenses or present offices, partners, shareholders, controllers, any of these people who have, once we find anything culpable, we can now um, sanction them. And in doing this, we also require the collaboration of our fellow um, IOKO and CID. Now, we, the revocation of licenses, we had the power under section 122 that where um, an individual, so we can revoke the license of an individual, a license of a, a market player. So in under section two, one, two, two, we were able to revoke um, on the 8th of um, November 2018, 53 licenses were revoked. And um, 40, later 40 liquidation orders were obtained. And then we had six freezing orders on trust accounts. And then the, the directives to securities exchange is um, controlled by section 48 and 209 of the act. So we can issue directives to the stock exchange. We can issue directives to individuals of the market and licensees to seize receiving documents. Now we have directives to licensees, former licensees, issuers or former issuers, officers or former officers. So with respect to the, the, the companies that were revoked, it doesn't matter that they are now in liquidation. If we find, we do the investigation, we find that an officer or um, a former licensee was not doing his work to the best of um, his ability and what the law requires, we can request that he does not um, play on the market or for a specified period of time. And then we can direct we can direct the premises to fully or partially close, and anything in it may be secured and left undistributed for as long as necessary. So the provision of Section 26 above can be carried out with the police assistance. Um, the commission itself does not have the capacity. So when we go to a premises to lock it up, we'll need police assistance to go there, lock it up. Even though the law gives us the right to do it, um, we need collaboration, as I said earlier, so that we can. Um, and then the investigations, um, the prosecution bit is covered by Section 207. Um, what the law tells us is that um, we should.
where, where the, we think the prosecution of an offense against the provisions of this shall be by the attorney generals. So on our own, we cannot prosecute, but we can do investigation, gather information, and then trans transfer the documentation to uh, the AG to prosecute if it's a criminal matter. And then we also have section 35, which also talks about some level of collaboration. And luckily we have had uh, an amendment to section 35, which expands the scope. So section 35 talks about the fact that um, where the commission has reason to suspect that an offense is being committed under the act, then um, under the act, or, has, or somebody has been found guilty of fraud or dishonesty in relation to dealing in securities and the business of an issuer, or is assisting other domestic or foreign regulatory authorities in their investigation, the commission may conduct investigation that the commission considers appropriate in the first ones of the act. So this is where um, CID and IOKO come in where we think that we can assist you or you can assist us into investigating into matters of fraud, dishonesty, and all that. We can collaborate and where need be, we submit the needed information to the uh, Attorney General for prosecution. Now, we can search um, the book, um, the books of, um, We can, we can go into premises, enter premises where we believe that the, the, the acts being done are in perpetration of, of a, a criminal offense or dishonesty. We can seize books, make, make copies, question people, and then halt activities of a business, a, a business. So with the freezing of assets, we are covered by section 204. But um, we can go into, we can go by court, I mean, ex parte motion. But Yoko has a faster process. So depending on where, how urgent it is, when we have a matter and we think that it, it is going to delay or going to court, uh, the processes may delay, we can court, uh, collaborate with the Yoko to immediately go in and get the accounts frozen and then we take the rest from there. Then we have the, um, also the authorization to freeze trust accounts and then um, do give penalties ranging from um, 50 penalty units to 20,000 penalty units as um, required by the Act. So I would leave the rest for questions when it is time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We expect a very interesting question and answer time. I believe a very pertinent part of the presentation was the areas indicated for collaboration between the SEC and uh, the law enforcement agencies. Now, we are coming to the end of our presentations. We just have a final presentation which examines something that you may all have experienced, would have intimate knowledge of. One of our earlier speakers spoke about people, you know, promising high returns for investment, or possibly you would know somebody who has been affected by such attractive schemes and they were left with nothing, right? So the key question is, what are the characteristics of these schemes? How do we know them? What kind of tactics are deployed by these schemes? Because we keep seeing the emergence of such schemes in the country. And I believe that such a platform creates an opportunity for experience sharing and, and learning. So we have brought a man to you who has very copious experience in positive schemes education. And he's none other than Mr. Francis Buedu from the SEC. So I'd like to invite him to the podium to do the final presentation. Shall we welcome him? Good, Good morning to you all. All protocol is duly observed. Uh, God, your introduction is very serious. <laughs> Copious knowledge in a Ponzi scheme. Uh, anyway, uh, I believe uh, the essence of this section of our program is to help all of us, particularly the law enforcement agencies, 
so that you get to know the strategies these promoters use to lure people into their schemes and finally, you know, <coughs> sorry, take their money. So if you get to know the strategies, then we'll be able to, when you are investigating them, we'll be able to answer the relevant questions to get the needed information so that it make the prosecution or whatever we want to do with them very easy. Uh, when we mention Ponzi scheme, there's one particular name that quickly comes into mind. And the name is uh, one Mr. Charles Ponzi, who started this uh, scheme. And the way he did it was that in around 1918, he received a letter. He was in the US. He received a letter from Spain. And in that letter, there was a return coupon that he can change the, the coupon for a higher coupon of money. And he realized that he can make money out of that because where the coupon was coming from, you know, he can buy it at a lower rate over there and exchange it in the US for a higher money. So what he decided to do is to send money to his agents in Europe to buy more of such coupons and send it to him in the US so that he can exchange them over there and get more money. And he realized that he was making money. So in order to get more money, for me, that was not a problem because in every market, there's what he called market arbitrage. But with time, that gap, you know, closes. But what he decided to do that, you know, landed him in the problem was that in order to get more people to bring money for him to buy these uh, coupons, he promised those who would give him money for 45 days and then he would give them a return of 50%. If your money stay with him for uh, 90 days, he will give you a return of 100%. That is what brought a problem to him. So at a point, he was not able to give people the returns that he has promised them. So what he resolved to do was that if Mr. A bring his money today, then when Mr. B comes, he will take Mr. B's money and give it to A. When Mr. B comes, he will take Mr. C's money and give it to him. That is the way he was operating. And the sustenance of this kind of scheme requires fresh inflows every time. Otherwise, you cannot maintain it. And that is where he got a problem because at a point, the money was not coming and people were demanding their money. So uh, the guy was charged about 86 in account and he was in prison for 14 years in the US. Then there's another scheme that also is very familiar in our environment. We call it a, a pyramid scheme. The difference between the Ponzi scheme and that of the pyramid is that with the Ponzi scheme, you give your money to the investment house or the farm manager who is so, wants to or supposed to invest the money. But with the pyramid, if we are five people, we recruit another people and then they will give their money to us. And then the another section also will go and recruit another people they will give their money to another set of people. So the ability of this kind of scheme to survive also requires exponential number of people to join the scheme, otherwise the scheme cannot survive. So when we talk about the Ponzi scheme and that of the pyramid scheme, the fundamental difference is that with the Ponzi scheme, the destination of the money goes to the investment house, whilst the uh, pyramid scheme, the money goes to you know, those who are above you and, and so and so forth. So that is how you know, those two schemes work. But because these two schemes require fresh inflow, they are sometimes used the term interchangeably to describe the two, but there's a fundamental difference between the two. Now let's see the key elements of the Ponzi scheme. Uh, the key elements that can help you to know the Ponzi scheme is that they always use new investors' money to pay the existing investors. And you don't see the fundamental economic business that they are using the money for. 
The promises that you are giving to the people, the question you ask yourself, if they ask you, we are going to give you a return of 40% or 45%, the next question any rational human being will ask is, what kind of business are they going to use their money to do to be able to generate that amount of return? If you ask for the fundamental economic business, you will find nothing. And that is another one element that you can also see in the Ponzi scheme. And another thing is that they use a creative accounting. Those with accounting background will understand this terminology very well. So that is what they use to you know, cook their boost to portray that the scheme is doing well. By the natural fact, there is nothing you know, to write home about. And these are some of the things that they use you know, to deceive people that, or to let the scheme appear that it is doing extremely well. Whereas in actual fact, there is nothing that you can, you know, uh, bank on. Now, what are the uh, Ponzi scheme promoters, what did they use when the scheme is about to collapse? Normally, uh, if you give your money to them, the next day you go there, you see the office is locked, there is nobody over there. You ask the security man, where's the manager? Manager didn't come to office today, and you can't find them anywhere. At times, too, they will sell the business. And sometimes, when there is an investigation go on, and they realize that you know, they are about to expose, they mobilize some of the, their clients to rise against the investigators. And I believe you are aware of what happened in this country some time ago. Whilst the regulators are trying to get more information about some of the activities, they organize people to go on demonstration just to frustrate you know, the process. These are some of the uh, strategies that they use to deceive people. Now, another, some of the tactics that they use is that when they come to you, they try to associate themselves with the people with the credibility, prominent people in the society church, mosque, or association that, oh, these people, they know us, we are part of them, so that people will have confidence in them. We call it source credibility. They try to get people who have made their life and people respect them. So when they mention their name that, oh, this man is part of, he's a director or something, it gives you comfort, you know, to be part of them. And they also use what we call social consensus. That is where they try to tell people, you know, everybody is here, everybody is investing in our scheme. Nobody has even lost money. You can ask people who have invested with us. They will try to give you a lot, whole lot of stories just to convince you that, you know, they are credible people or a credible institution. Let's see how the victims of Ponzi scheme, you know, how they suffer. Uh, Usually those, because the scheme is complex, the people who put their money in don't really understand how the scheme works. So they try to bring out a very complex instrument, financial instruments that people don't understand. And another area, I, I, I was glad when uh, Mrs. Opoku mentioned due diligence. Most people, when they are going to invest, what they fail to do is do thorough due diligence about the investment company or the scheme that they are going to invest in. I remember a case that was brought to us. There was a very, very beautiful and well-educated lady who came to us with a complaint. And according to her, she was in her office one day when her colleague introduced a gentleman to her that this uh, a friend of mine works with one of the investment firms. So the lady decided to give money to the gentleman to invest on her behalf. The first money that the lady gave it to the gentleman, the gentleman went back to his office, opened an account for the lady, and every month the lady was giving the gentleman money to go and invest. The interesting thing is that after the first deposit that the gentleman took to his company to open the account, all the other money that the lady gave to him the gentleman went and print a receipt book bearing the name of the company that he was working for. So when the woman gave 
him the money, he will just issue the receipt and give it to the lady, signify that you know the company has received the money. And when the time comes for the lady for to redeem his her investment, the gentleman was no more with the company. She asked her friend, the friend doesn't know the whereabouts of the gentleman. And the only thing that saved her was the, the receipt which was bearing the name of the company. So with that, she came through the city of Accra to locate where the company was. And she was lucky to find the company, presented her documents, and the people say, we have only one deposit standing in your name. So she lodged a complaint with the commission. We called the officials, and they were very good people. We asked two or three questions. That did you know the gentleman? Yes. Was he doing a marketing for you? Yes. And the other question, so uh, finally they absorbed the liability and paid the lady. And we told them, you are very lucky. You know, we asked her, uh, did you complete KYC form? No. She didn't even know the, where the company was. She didn't even know. So when the madam was talking about the due diligence, I, I was very happy. Uh, let me try to play a gender balance here so that the ladies doesn't hackle me at the end of the program. Important, we take time to do due diligence about the company, the people behind the company, the scheme that we are going to put your money in, and everything about you know, the company that can help you to be more convinced of what we are about to do. Now, how can I see that this is a, a Ponzi scheme, the red flags? You know, they will promise you high return. I think this has been mentioned over and over. So I, I will uh, jump it and so that. Another thing they will try to tell you is that we will give you consistent positive returns. That is never true. It can't happen. In every economy, even when you go to uh, what is my uh, this place? Uh, domain market for uh, <laughs> the, a, a, a box of tomato that you bought it last week. Next week, when you go there, you may not get it at the same price. So this economic fluctuation is there. Even tomato, it affects it. How come this is a complex financial instrument? So if somebody is promising you a consistent positive return, that itself should speak to you that there's something wrong that you have to be very careful. And also, they also try to tell you, oh, your investment received with us, uh, they will make a statement that nobody has ever lost his investment with us. So when you come to us, you are safe. And some of these schemes are also not registered. I remember one day I was in my office when I had a call from our front desk that a gentleman is looking for uh, us to talk to us and I asked the gentleman to come. When he came, his issue was that he wants to be a clothing broker. So he wants to find out whether the commission licensed clothing broker or whatever. I, I, that was the first time I was hearing you know, that clothing broker. So what we normally do at the commission, when there's a new product, we require the promoter to come and do a presentation to us and see the business model and other things. And if it requires our license, then we can license the product. So as the gentleman, I will schedule an appointment for him that he should come and do the presentation. There's a, a team at the office to the committee. If after the presentation, if what he wants to do requires our license, we'll give him the license. If not, we will tell him. So in the two weeks later, he came back that then we should tell him if he doesn't need our license, we should give him a letter to indicate that he doesn't require our license. And I told him, gentlemen, we don't work like that. Now he wants a letter from us to go around and say that SEC said that what I'm doing doesn't require license. So I don't have a problem with the SEC. The SEC has nothing to do with what I'm doing. So they will come to you with all manner of stories, telling our brothers and sisters, our friends, that, oh, this one doesn't fall under the SEC purview. So some of these schemes are not registered, and we might be 
month for when some of them come to us that you know uh, we have gone to SEC and they say that we can do whatever we want to do now how do we avoid uh, such people the first thing that we advise people to do is that we should be very skeptical when they come to you ask all the questions that you, you have take your time to ask every bit of question that crosses your mind whether it's a good question or whatever ask those questions and let them provide you with the answers and if you are there and somebody calls you that oh we have this say we have this and that be careful something that we have not planned to do if someone calls you that uh, we have this so come and put your money in uh, be careful don't run and go and put your money into something that you have not purposed your heart to do and also check the people who are selling the product to you to find out whether they have the relevant license to do what they are trying to do and most importantly if you don't understand the scheme even though we are encouraging people to invest but at the same time we are advising people that they should not put their money in any scheme that they don't understand if you go there anybody goes there the people should be able to explain the scheme to you in the layman's terms so that you understand after all not all of us have got an accounting and finance background so when they come they should be able to explain what they are doing in a simple language that my grandmother in my village will be able to understand I remember when this uh, cleanup exercise uh, came up there were some people who came to our office that we put our money in this scheme they call it finance structure and when you ask them what is finance structure they, they will, then they will look at your face they themselves don't understand it but they want to put their money in now that there's a problem you run to us well, <laughs> so let's try to understand the scheme that we are putting our money in that will help us and lastly if there is anything that is going on that we are not you know, comfortable or we suspect something please let us report it to the SEC, Yoko, CID, and together we'll be able to eradicate uh, the criminals from our environment. Thank you very much. I think we can do it a lot better. I told you that his reputation is well deserved. That was very insightful. Great. So we've come to the open forum and we've had presentations on a number of different topics so this is a chance to ask your questions and make your inputs so this is the open forum and the final aspect of the program so if you have a question please come right behind the microphones in the aisle this is the time thank you okay thank you thank you so whilst we wait for the questions to come I would just allow each of the speakers to just add a few highlights on each of the things that they spoke about. So like just a minute. So I'm going to go from uh, Dr. Edu, go from to Mr. Abebio, and also uh, our specialist as well. So just a few highlights of what you just said, the key points, and then we'll take it from there. So Dr. Edu, over to you. Remember, this is knowledge sharing, experience sharing. So. I believe that beyond the questions that you may not have had some clarity, be sure to share your experience with that. So, Paul, you have the floor, please. Thank, thank you very much, Godwin. I think there was one development that also happened this year that my colleague Deborah mentioned. Uh, we launched what we call the Capital Market Master Plan, um, and that's a 10-year a um, development plan. It's available on our website. And I think part of this, when you are investigating an issue, you need to understand some of the dynamics that we're trying to go. There are new products um, all around the world that we don't have in Ghana here. And the challenge is that people are trying to have those products. Interestingly, I mentioned the gaps. And to Mr. Voodoo's point about the Ponzi schemes, we all heard of, we all heard of cryptocurrency. Oftentimes, people say they're doing cryptocurrency, but they're offering 10% a month. That is not cryptocurrency, right? 
So such, such questions, we get that inflow. So if you go on, on the website, we have the master plan. We also have other things on SEC. Um, when we issue notices, it's always on our website as well. You may not get a particular news when you may have issued it, but it's available on our website. So that's a good source. On our website, you go into the About Us section. One of the drop downs is, is the Capital Market Master Plan. And I think subsequently we'll be engaging the public more extensively on that. Thank you. Okay, so let me emphasize uh, a point about companies inviting the public to deposit money with them. As I said, we have two forms of invitations. One is a company inviting you to come and buy their shares. In fact, when we are buying shares, the monies don't go directly into the company. We, we institute what we call an escrow account. All the people who pay for the shares have their monies logged in an account that we call escrow. At the end of the offer, the advisors who help with the offering will write to the SEC that at the end of the offer, they have been able to raise, let's say, 500 million CDs. How much, you ask them, how much did you set out to raise? Well, I wanted to raise 1 billion. What was the minimum? 300. So if you have been able to raise 500, that means the offer is successful. Then the SEC will authorize the escrow bank to lease the money to the issuer, the company, to start working with. But these other people who invite others to come and deposit money with them, if, let's, let's talk about the, the regular one, the normal one. If you are going to deposit your money with a bank, there's no escrow account anyway. The money goes to the bank straight away. You have a savings account or a current account. And the other one which poses problems is those who don't have the right to do so. If you are not a bank, if you are not an insurance company, or if you are not a unit trust that SEC has licensed, you can't invite somebody to come and deposit money with you. You see? So to be able to invite somebody to deposit money with you, you must be a bank, an insurance company, or licensed under some of the products of the SEC. Otherwise, what we'll be doing is an illegality. So that is why I try to point out the fact that any time the, the, the agencies, law enforcement agencies, CID, Yoko, and others, you will hear about somebody inviting people to deposit money with them. That is a very serious one. Find out whether even by the Companies Act provisions, that person even qualifies to do what it is doing. Cross-check with SEC whether, see sometimes you may hear it earlier than you will hear, whether SEC has approved any such prospectus or authorized any such person or licensed any such person to ask people to deposit money with. If all these things prove negative, then you know that person is a trickster and must not be allowed to continue to remain in the society to cause harm to people who have worked so hard to raise some funds. <laughs> we can applaud him, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, we will be taking our first question uh, from this side, but I also allow, just after the question, allow the leadership of the CID and uh, you go to also add some additional inputs. But I'll start with the question. So you have the floor. You so I want to find out the kind of, the type of crimes that are usually reported to CID by Security and Estate Commission, and then whether we had the logistics to handle such cases. Okay, so the first question, the type of crimes reported, and this question was to the CID. So if you could respond very quickly, I will allow you to. Okay, that's the first one. And we'll take the second question. Your name and where you are coming from, please. I'm also Chief Inspector Evelyn Bassin, Tamaraji Police. Okay. 
My question goes, the first question goes to Mrs. Perpetua. She mentioned that uh, they work hand in hand with AG office CIDs to bring out uh, disqualified people by entering into premises so that they, do, they will do away with such people. And being investigator, what I've come re to realize is that at times they will come to us, we will help. But at the end of the day, a day or two or a year or a month, you will still see the same corporates out there doing the same thing again. So what are they going to do about it as a, a lawyer representing or helping? And the second one is to Mr. Boadu. Uh, I want to know that uh, you mentioned that uh, when people come to us, we should be suspicious and skeptical when they want to engage us in any financial things. At times, these people pass through our organizations that we are, uh, let me say, uh, financial so, so and so. They pass through our organizations before they get the personnel involved. So if something like this should happen, what do we do? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have two questions so far. So I'll allow uh, our representative from the CID to respond to the first question, and then we'll take the second. Okay, please, you have the floor. And you go. Okay, good morning again. Um, my name is Superintendent Naomi Akwa, Director Interpol, and I'm holding brief for Mr. AJ, Deputy Director, CID. Okay. If I heard her well, the question was, what types of crimes does the Security Exchanges Commission report to the CID? Um, we actually receive a wide cra a range of crime from all crime areas, but with regards to the Security Exchanges Commission and exactly what they do, I think that it would be best if we heard from them the types of crimes they, brought, they bring to us, actually because um, we have a central registry to receive the crimes and the reports, actually. So it would vary depending on what the issue is. For which reason, I can't say specifically what types of crimes they would bring. Okay. But I think since they are here, if they could tell us what the crimes are that they actually report to us. Okay, so the question has been deflected today. This is Ajifra will take the response. So just to say that um, at this point in time, the number of ca the cases that we've sent are on two major issues. The first one is not using trust accounts in the way they should be used. So trust accounts are essentially for investor funds. The companies are not supposed to use trust accounts for their operations. So they are not supposed to pay salaries. They are not supposed to buy vehicles pay SNET or anything out of that account. It's for the investor. So when they put their money in, they should place it for the investor. So when we go on supervision or they bring their reports and we find out that they have not used the trust account, well, because they're a criminal offense under our act, we forward that um, to them. And the second one has been insider dealing. As Jacob said, the capital raising and everything has to be as transparent as possible. But if there are people with information inside there affecting the share prices, trying to do things that are not transparent or not sharing information the right way, then those people have also been reported to the CID. So at this point in time, those are the two major cases we have. Okay, thank you. There's also another question about uh, corporates being found later on after they've been helped. So what are we doing differently? Or what's the SEC doing differently about people who uh, the SEC engages in terms of the law enforcement authorities and all that? What are we doing differently? It's a process. So I think what should be clear is that if the AG has prosecuted, then at the end of the day, there'll be an outcome of that case. But if the case didn't, all the investigations didn't lead to a prosecution, then maybe that's why you still find them out there. But when it comes to our space, 
what we do is that we can disqualify. That's the process we are going through right now. So that hasn't happened yet. And also, when we are giving licenses, we go through the people who are applying, they are shareholders, directors, and all that. And if we see that somebody is not suitable for our capital market space, then the person will not be part of those who be given the license. So we are still doing that. But maybe you see them doing other businesses, but not SEC-specific businesses, I think. Okay, thank you. That's a question to Mr. Buedu about people we have to be skeptical about. So what is your response? What our advice is that if anybody walks to your office and bring a proposal that they have investment product they, they want to sell it to your staff or want to show it to your staff, as a frontline officer, what I would suggest is that quickly run it by the commission, whether that firm is licensed by the commission and the commission is aware of that product before you open your door for such a, a firm or person to come and do the presentation to your personnel. Thank you. All right. So um, I'll let the gentleman go first. Okay. My name is Mr. Francis Adebo from Yoko. Okay. My question goes to Dr. Edu. And if the need arises, Mrs. Yankee will come in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully the need will not arise. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Edu mentioned four means of uh, supervision. That's uh, licensing, approvals, supervision, and then uh, enforcement. I want to find out, is there any time frame set for these uh, supervisory roles to be executed? And if that's so, how come number one, for that matter, men's gold, was allowed to pray for a while before <coughs> they came in and then flash him out. Then legally, that's where Mrs. Yang, Yang Sim will come in. <laughs> so what were you waiting for, for all this? <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll let the lady Thank give you. us a question. Um. My name is Andrella Gansa from Yoko. Um, from the discussion, they said that um, it can take six months for you to get a license. I wanted to know what's the process and the duration, that's my uncle asked, asked already, because we wanted to find out probably there is a long process for it or a short process. Because if it takes six months, and that six months, time is money, as we always say and the company hasn't received the license. Are you going to give a prototype license or you have to wait for that while? Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. The next question. All right, my, my, my name is Kofi Juma from Omi Television. Okay. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Bordu. Um, is, uh, Mr. Bordu mentioned that uh, uh, some of the, um, this in, the victims also used to come to your office sometimes when they fall into this, uh, uh, this uh, um, in, in the hands of these perpetrators. Uh, may I know, uh, when they come to your office, what, what do you do to them? And also, uh, um, uh, I don't know if you pay them or whatever, what do you do to them exactly? That's what I want to know. And uh, my, sec my second question has to do with, uh, um, um, have you ever you know, uh, apprehend so these perpetrators before, and if yes, what are the punishment that you people are giving to them? Thank you so much. Okay, I think we have enough questions for this set. All right, Dr. Edu, you have the floor. Okay, so let me address the six, six month issue. Mm -hmm. Actually, the six month is not for licensing. It's if you want to issue shares and you've come to SEC for your prospectus to be approved, you have six months within which to raise the funds for your company. Yes, for licensing and approvals, within three to six weeks, you get your approval. Between three to six weeks, any license from SEC, you get your approval, provided you have 
supplied all the information that is, is required of you. So that is the clarification on the, on the sixth month. Uh, my friend uh, threw a question at me and said, if they need B, so <laughs> if they need will, will, will arise. Four. <laughs> See, number one, or let's use, you know, they start as men's bank. Bank, B, A, and initial was bank itself, K. Then when Bank of Ghana started chasing them, now they became men's bank with their C. So trying to avoid Bank of Ghana or trying to, 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 to say that what they are doing is not exactly banking. And so their activities were being studied. Remember Bank of Ghana issued several warnings to our people, but it appeared the kind of returns they were giving was so enticing that reasonable human beings, so to speak, wouldn't want to, I mean, sit and listen to what the others were, were doing. So what we did eventually was also try to participate ourselves through mystery shopping to see exactly what men's bank, now men's gold, now it has become gold. And so it is not bank again. So now they've shifted from bank to gold, which has some semblance of a security. And even that, you go and pay your money, you go somewhere else to collect your gold. Sometimes you leave the gold with them. Every month you get your 10%, so in a year, 120%. Then it's like what we say. You don't have any license whatsoever to do what it was doing. So every, every regulator or every law enforcement agency would have the power under the Companies Act to close them down. And that was what eventually SEC did to stop the, the festering of, of men's gold issue. So they started by trying to avoid every regulator. But at a point we felt, I mean, let us, let us, let us raise the hammer and let's see what happens thereafter. Thank you. A gentleman's question was, what do we do to uh, people who have, you know, suffered in the hands of these uh, Ponzi scheme promoters? Uh, it's true that some of them come to our office to report. And if they come and they mention the name of the company and it's our licensee, then commission takes, you know, the, take the necessary action on that licensee. But if the company is not licensed by the commission, the advice we give it to such people is that they should report it to a CID or they can go to Yoko. Because if they don't fall under us, it becomes difficult for our law to take action against them. So that is what we do. Thank you. Just to add to what Mr. Boydu said, we've issued public notices. Sorry, we. Okay, so it's okay. okay. So just to add to what Mr. Boydu said, we've issued public notices on companies that are not licensed by us. So when the complaints keep coming and we realize that it's a national issue, we go ahead and we issue a public warning. Like as we said, we did with CHI, CHY more, and Yoko did the same thing. GIPC did the same thing on the same company. Okay. Thank you. So I see you have another question. No, right. it's a follow-up question. Okay. In Please follow up. He said that we used three weeks for you to get your license. Was it three or six weeks? He said three. Three to six. So I wanted to find out the process that they go through before you can, because six weeks and um, six months is a short period. So I just want to know that the um, due diligence you go through before you get the license. Okay. The six weeks is, is, is clear from the six months. With the licensing, when you, you want, let's say, a fund management license from SEC or book the license, there's a form on our website. You fill the forms. You add your business plan. You pay your requisite application fee. 500 or 200 or so. 
And then the other thing that sometimes keep the process to the six weeks or even more is when, see, we have to also make sure that people, especially the directors, are people of high integrity. So we refer them to the CID and the, the police for investigations, I mean, on their backgrounds. And we want to receive the report from the police. Before. The police one sometimes comes early, but the CID one sometimes keeps long. So even if we have the, the, the police one and it's favorable, we're able to give you provisional license while you wait for the CID one, which is very extensive. The CID one comes early, BNI one delays a bit. And so if you get the CID one, based on that, you do the license to operate, pending the receipt of the BNI report. If that comes and you find that they, I mean, found some adverse things about you, we revoke our license. So that's the process that normally goes through. And the commission will sit, look at all the information that we have about you, your business plan, if your people are qualified enough, competent enough, you are given the license to, to operate. Please, I hope you, you get the six month one. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. So whilst we wait for, or get ready for the next round, I'll quickly allow Mr. Kuju to see a few things. You can use the mic over there. He happens to be uh, Director of um, Admin. Okay, Mr. Kuju. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And let me say thank you to the management of the SEC for inviting us to participate in this program. I think it's timely. It's just one bit of the cooperation we are seeking to have going forward, and we are grateful for the opportunity. I think that um, our being here with CID is not an accident because we work in the same space. Um, they are big brothers, but we also back them up some way, somehow. And from the presentations that have been made, clearly we are seeking to find where we play, uh, the role we play in the business of the Securities and Exchange Commission from the licensing right up through the operations and even to the time when people want to get their investments through entities registered by the Securities and Exchange Commission. I think that from especially the last speaker's um, presentation, he practicalizes what is expected from us regarding people taking advantage of the system and how as investigators we can be able to tell or have indices of wrongdoing and then pick it up from there, bring them up into cases get them investigated, and be able to get prosecutions and convictions for the populace to see that it is not an area that is free for all. There are regulations, there are standards, there are processes. So that if we are able to identify the indicators as investigators, whenever somebody comes with a complaint, from the very onset you can tell where the investigation is going and who you need to speak to and how you have to proceed. So it's not really about, it's not just about them making presentations for us, but they're also pointing us to areas where we can stand on to initiate investigations or do better investigations. They are provided sections of the law where there are major infractions or major gaps that we can look at. And I think that from the feedback they'll get from us, they would also look at their own processes and how it fits into the global picture for us to prosecute offenses emanating from infractions of the law regarding the, regarding the Security and Exchanges Exchange Commission. I want to add that this process, and I think eventually, one of the benefits of what you're seeking to get out of this process will be to find out the gaps that still exist regarding dealing with the environment, the SEC operating. So for example, for a long time, like the last presenter said, how to categorize an anonymous business whether it's banking, whether it's securities, whether it was a challenge. So going forward now, they have a system in place, probably, which will have indices that determine that this falls under jurisdiction, and that falls under the jurisdiction of the Bank of Ghana. This indices should be shared with law enforcement. So for CID, for police, we should be able to have that indices, be able to determine clearly that this, is, this falls under the mandate of SEC, or falls under the mandate of a different organization, or a different supervisory body so that we can proceed from there. Now, on the issues of, especially on Ponzi schemes and pyramid schemes, um, technology has come to muddy 
the field a bit. So you wouldn't ordinarily see the, the build up of capital or a typical Ponzi scheme for what it is. So there are nuances. And for us investigators, we need to be able to take off the layers to tell the building blocks of these transactions. Now, they come in different names. Some even use the name cryptocurrency when they, in fact, it's a Ponzi scheme for whatever it is. It's just the dressing they give to it. So if it comes to you and you know the indices per the presentation he has made, you will be able to see that, forget the name they have put on the business, but this is what it is and this is what they're doing. We can only get better when we sharpen skills at such fora. So I'm hoping that whilst we are, we are going through this process and asking our questions, we are noting some of the salient points that are coming out from here and that our investigations or our docket building will reflect these things so that they can portray we can get the necessary results that we need when we build them or present them to the law house for prosecutions. Thank you very much, and I wish you all fruitful deliberations. Thank you very much. Shall we put our hands together for Director of Admin Iuko, Mr. Edward Kujo? All right, so we'll come back to the questions. I would like to start with the ladies. Okay, so you have the floor. My name is Nafa Lekwote from Iuko. Okay. Please, I want to find out how best. SEC can help us make good use of the proceeds of crime. Example, the confiscated properties from those criminals. After the investigations, we do confiscate their properties, like cars, houses, and things. At the end of the day, we leave them at the mercy, especially the houses, at the mercy of the reptiles and whatever, and then the cars, just at the, uh, at the mercy of the sun to go rotting. Meanwhile, we pay huge sums of money to rent places for meetings, stuff like this. And other, meanwhile, those buildings are there at the mercy of the sun and then the um, vehicles. So I want to know how best SEP can could help us, especially Yoko, to make good use of such properties. Okay, these assets, all right, thank you. Second question. All right. Um, my, my second question was not answered. That's why I came here again. Okay. Uh, in fact, I may mention that uh, if those perpetrators have been you know, arrested before, okay. uh, what are the punishments that they are given to them? So what, this was to Mr. Buedu. Yes, you know? sir. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> the punishments for the perpetrators if they were arrested. All right. You have the floor. Thanks, Lassar. Ghanian Times. My question goes to the set boss. Uh, First, I want to find out how many unlicensed companies uh, has SEC identified and reported to the appropriate authorities for investigations and prosecutions, maybe over the next two to three years, if they can share with us. And apart from the public coming to inform you of unlicensed companies, uh, does a SEC has a structure to identify online sales companies. Uh, my second question also goes to the SEC boss. Why is the Ponzi scheme still popping up? Is it that the sanctioning scheme or the regime is not so punitive, so they keep on coming because at the end of the day, they will enjoy their booty without any prosecution. And I also want to find out how many of the, the companies that you revoke their license how many of them have been prosecuted? And when you report any criminal activity to the Yoko or CID, do you see to the do you, do, you, do you ensure that the perpetrators are prosecuted to serve as deterrent to others? Thank you. Okay, so quite a range of questions. There was a question about how we can help who make use of the assets which are confiscated. But do you want to start with? Oh, let me address the gentleman's question. I think uh, from the onset, we have made it clear that the commission don't have the prosecution power. So when there is an issue and report to AG department for the necessary court action, uh, that one goes out of our plate. So what happens between the AG and the court I think uh, uh, my colleague lawyer is here. I think that, um, the, as he said, the clarity is that when the, there's a crime involved, 
So where Se comes in and where Yoko comes in is that it's an economic crime. And there are limitations to what we can do when it's an economic crime. Now, when we think that the criminal um, tweak to it, we have done our investigations, ours is to pass that on to the AG and then through the necessary law enforcement activities, that prosecution can be done. That's one aspect. Now with the revocations, when the revocations were done, the Registrar General was notified and the companies were liquidated. Now the Registrar General is the liquidator. Usually when assets are confiscated and it's, for, it's to the state or, um, I mean given that even if it was for any of the liquidated companies, it is now within the ambit of the Registrar General to sell those assets and give back that, those funds to the state. Because as it is now, the state has used funds to pay investors. So the state needs to recover those, those funds. So I think that we here all would have to play our various roles. So if Yoko has done any investigation or has confiscated assets, those assets should be, the Registrar General should be notified of those assets of the relocated companies so that they can instigate, uh, institute the action, appropriate action to sell off those assets and recover those funds for the state. So that's where we all need to play our part. And uh, when it's, it's a criminal activity, like I said earlier, then it goes to the prosecution bit. And then until somebody has been um, convicted of a crime, really, there's not so much you can do. Once you have recovered your funds under the civil uh, procedure, that is the extent to which we can go. So I don't know whether that clarifies the issues. Not, not so much. Madam, please, how long? Sometimes <laughs> years. And the, by, the, by the end of the case, the vehicle or maybe the building might have rotting. I, I think this is a high level. I think now we need, like he said, your, your um, HR said, this is a collaboration. For us as SEC, I think that our bosses have engaged Yoko and um, AG for a faster resolution to some of these things. Because it was only um, last two years that we revoked. So that was when we did the major action. And then there are follow-ups. We are uh, at this point. At this stage, we are now um, doing our further investigations on the individual directors and shareholders. When we finish that investigation, we will know what action, but those are to the individuals. Now to the assets, they are assets of those companies, and those need to be sold by the liquidator. Okay, so um, maybe now, Kale, just to add to what um Perpetua just said, um, you know, the issue uh, about our sector is that we had to use the liquidation pathway. So until the liquidation order has been granted, um, there is not, um, if you like, much that can be done when it comes to the assets. And when it's granted, like Perpetua said, it's granted to the official liquidator who then um, re re realizes proceeds from the asset. So that is what it is. In our case, we revoked the licenses of 53 firms. Uh, three uh, went through the administrative hearings committee. So effectively, 50 companies had their licenses revoked. Out of the 50, 47 had claims filed against them. As we speak, the court has granted 43 out of the 47 liquidation petitions. That's about 91%. Uh, so we have four outstanding. So it's a question of the official liquidator following through the uh, various processes to realize uh, proceeds. And wh whether it's a building, whatever it is to realize and then be able to return to the state um, you know, some of the money. I, I'm not sure if all can be um, uh, recovered, but the hope is that we'll be, the official liquidator, liquidator will be able to recover as much as possible from uh, these assets. I suspect that maybe 
the ones that you are mentioning may belong to other um, processes, for instance, maybe the um, receiverships or some other processes. But where we are concerned, um, you know, we started the process November 2019. As at the end of 2020, I think we had uh, 23 liquidation orders, and the remaining ones came in the course of the year. So it, it's a process that is ongoing, and at least we have been uh, giving the, very, the signal from the ministry that we have to push hard to ensure that as much is realized from the, um, the assets so that uh, the states can, can um, you know, have some, some of the money they have uh, spent in the bailout uh, returned. So that's, I think, what we can say on that. There was a question about um, the number. How many uh, unlicensed, unlicensed Ponzi schemes um, we have referred to Yoko? Uh, what's the structure we have in place to identify unlicensed or Ponzi schemes? And then why do we still have Ponzi schemes uh, coming up? I think that was a question that uh, one of the uh, people uh, asked. Um, in, in terms of the cases that we have referred to Iyoko, I don't have the list here, but the practice is as soon as we get a case and we do our initial investigation and we are convinced that it is uh, worth investigating further, then it is referred to Iyoko. Uh, so that, I mean, we have, we have a list, just that as I sit here, I don't have the uh, the, the list uh, on the top of my head. But the practice is we get the information or the tip off. We do our investigation and then we, um, we, we, we forward it. Um, how can we pick up uh, these schemes? Clearly, uh, we can't be everywhere. Uh, clearly, our resources are limited. So we keep uh, messaging the investing public you know, through our various education campaigns. We recently ran a series on Ponzi schemes and we uh, made a point that when they see any of the signs that we have put out there concerning Ponzi scheme, they should alert us because it's not possible for us to be able to, uh, on our own, using our own resources, one regulator, to pick up all the uh, schemes in the system. So we continue to rely on the investing public to alert us when they see anything that looks like um, you know, a Ponzi scheme based on the telltale signs that we put out there. So we continue to rely on the general public, the investing public. But we have recently created a dedicated investigations department um, you know, so that they can, um, uh, through their intelligence, you know, find ways of picking up uh, these uh, schemes. But I know, and I'm sure you know that it's not possible for that department to pick up all the schemes that would be out there. So we are doing what we can based on our resources, but we also continue to uh, encourage the, uh, the general public uh, to let us know if they pick up anything that they are not, um, they are not sure of. Uh, as to why Ponzi schemes exist, uh, they will continue to exist, unfortunately, because people are one greedy, and two people do not take time to get information. Okay, I remember um, when um, I mean, there was a time I, I was engaging with the, the SEC in the U.S. and I was asking about these Ponzi schemes, and they were saying that um, you know they, they have their fair share of Ponzi schemes emerging. You know, after the big one, uh, Madoc, uh, they've had a couple of other uh, big ones. And it's because of the, the, the human nature, uh, looking for quick wins or, um, you know, a fast, um, you know, return, you know, you want more, et cetera. Et cetera. So as for, as for Ponzi schemes, um, unfortunately, it will continue to um, emerge. They may go under after a while and surface. And you know, even after some of the announcements that we have made, it surprises me that 
there are still people coming up with very ridiculous schemes, and you still find people uh, falling for it. You know, so I, I, I'm not sure we can say we will be able to eliminate uh, Ponzi scheme because it's, it's a phenomenon that is all over uh, the world. So what we have to do is to minimize, um, you know, uh, its emergence as much as we can and alert the public. That's why we believe that a well-informed investor is a well-protected investor. So once you're informed, when you see that this is looking like a Ponzi scheme, then you look for the exits. You know, so I think that is what uh, we can do um, with regard to the, the Ponzi schemes. Yeah, I think the other questions have been answered, so I will not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we'll take the last question, since you're already up. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Lance Corporal Raymond Ganaji from CID Administration. Okay. Uh, we've been receiving letters from SEC requesting a background check or sometimes criminal check to be conducted on directors of some of these capital market uh, directors. So what we do is that we invite the directors, take their fingerprints, scan it into our criminal database system, and also visit the residence of these directors and do some background checks on them and then based on that to report. So I want to find out whether that is enough or what exactly do you want us to do if you want a background check to be conducted on a particular director. Thank you. What I would say is that um, what we are looking for is to pass people who are fit and proper. Okay, and the fit and proper includes their financial integrity, um, their knowledge, uh, competence, and if they have any um, record of criminal activity, etc., etc. So, to the extent that what you do um, gives us um, that view, I think it's good. But I am always of the view that uh, the room of improvement is never full. In other words, whatever system is in place, you can improve it. So if there's any way from your experience you can get even more information. Our objective is to be sure that we are licensing someone who will not pose a danger, you know, all in support of our objective of investor protection. So we are happy with what you are doing now. If you can do better than what you are doing, we'll be, uh, we'll be all for it. That will be my, my response. Okay. Thank you. I think we'll allow this one. Mine is not a question. It's something I want to, I want my sister to know. The one who was, who asked a question about the properties. Of the assets, land. yes. Yes. There's a procedure. I'm a CID. Anytime we get somebody, the moment you charge the person for court and you tender the evidence, there's a procedure. You, then the judge will make order whether we should sell it, and then the money passed through a channel to the state coffers, like Rev said. So there's always a procedure for those abandoned vehicles and properties or retrieved from the perpetrators. So I will, I will suggest my sister, when she gets back to the office, she should contact the big men and find out how their procedure is done so that she can also go by it because we are doing the same to do away with uh, the abandoned properties or the things we retrieve from the perpetrators. Thank you. All right, thank you. I think I'll allow some very quick reactions before we have the final comments. Okay, uh, Mr. Ababio. On the licensing side, um, our new guidelines introduces a fit and proper principle, as my colleagues alluded to. And one element is the issue of um, solvency or financial viability. Um, so again, one of the checks we want to introduce is that is that person or have they defaulted on some loans? Uh, you find some people who have um, defaulted on loans, they are running around, running businesses, and they continue to go for licenses. So I think that's one check. We, the BNI actually goes to the educational background and all that, but you'll find that in the financial sector, people may not be, have been convicted of a crime per se because the, the ability to convict on criminal base is actually quite difficult. We rarely see 
uh, an adverse report. So we want to expand it to look at financial background. The employment record is also good. What was the reason for leaving past employment? Were they fired? Was there misdemeanor? Were there HR issues? Um, and that gives a better sense. We cannot prevent it. Um, and, and we can just put in place measures to control and to have a sense of what to expect. Because if there's high risk person in the system, we need to appreciate that and put the necessary measures in place. Sometimes we can even prevent, we ask some companies to replace the proposed persons. So even though the law gives us the ability to do that, it doesn't, and that's why he asked about the time. So if the person comes five weeks later, say, well, we found this adverse information. They have to go and replace the people. It takes, it depends how long they come back to us on that matter. On their prospectus, we find errors. Go back and fix it before we give the approval. And that also can, can lead to some delays in, in the process of license. So we do all those checks. It doesn't mean that once you come and you fill the form, you go. We do the checks. If everything is fine, then within that time it's done. If not, we do further queries or ask for changes to be done. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have a very quick remark closing. Before we have the chairman's remarks, uh, ACP and Deputy Director General of the CID, Mr. AJ, would like to say a few things before uh, we allow you. If I let me just go this way so we can pass the microphones on on all that has been said. So. Either the lady starts first or the gentleman starts. Thank you. Uh, my is just a two harmless question. The first one is uh, per Mr. Bodu's presentation or submission. Uh, he did mention that uh, when investing in the capital markets, clients or customers have to do due diligence. For instance, in the case of uh, Gold Coast management or fund management, you know, the personalities behind this fund management, there are people we deemed to be credible. But yet, clients or customers fall victims to their activities. My question is, what, uh, or what is SEC doing to flash out this underperformed fund management? The second question is, what is SEC, SEC doing to forestall investor confidence and also instill discipline in the capital markets. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Would like to add any additional remark before we answer that? Or uh, did you want to speak to that? Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, um, on behalf of ACP, Mr. Eche and the CID administration, we want to thank SEC for this opportunity and this insightful meeting. It's a hope that we work together to help rid our country of these Ponzi schemes that actually threaten our economy and take monies from people. And we also hope that there will be more activities like these ones to enable us to understand SEC better and to enable us to seek the needed assistance when required. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Okay, so maybe to, to respond to the, the, the questions raised. So let me, um, if you like, take my time to um, explain something. I think sometimes people ascribe merit. There's something called merit-based regulation. People ascribe merit to what a regulator um, would approve, okay? And then they don't do any due diligence uh, at, at all. But it's important to understand that, you know, from the regulatory point of view, um, we insist especially on adequate disclosure to the um, investing public. You know, so making sure, so for instance, when Jacob is reviewing, I mean, his team is reviewing a prospectus. Uh, we have a checklist. There are some things that we'll check to be sure that um, you know, there's adequate disclosure. Of course, we'll check the reasonability of um, the um, assumptions and so on and so forth. But the point I'm trying to make is that the fact that SEC may have approved an issue 
or giving a license, it doesn't mean that you, the, um, the potential investor, shouldn't do your own analysis. Because remember that when it comes to our area, there's an element of risk. There can be high risk, there can be medium risk, there can be low risks. Let me give an example. If a government uh, issues a bond, okay, the risk associated with the government bond cannot be compared to the risk associated with a, a private company issuing a bond. So while we would um, you know, approve it, you must also ask questions and make sure that you understand. I think a point Mr. Boydou made was that understand what you are getting uh, into. And so you shouldn't say that, oh, but SEC licensed this entity. You must ask questions. So uh, let's say um, the example you mentioned, uh, let's say uh, Black Shield or, 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 or Gold Coast. So if they have a product, they have been licensed by the SEC. But if they are selling a product to you, you should ask questions. This product, how does it work? Um, what are the risk return characteristics? So you can satisfy yourself that this one, I can do it. Uh, this one, I'm not comfortable, so I'll just stay with this one. So I think that people ascribe merit. So the once it's, it's been, it's been um, licensed, that's it. No, but you, you need to do your own questioning and get the information. So you are making an informed choice. Because with investment, you, know, you have that um, range of low to high risk. And if you can deal with low risk, so if you can deal with high risk, then you know that it also has um, a certain potential. So I think that, that's an important point uh, that people must, um, must understand. You know, the fact that um, when the regulator um, approves uh, or gives a license, um, we have satisfied ourselves that the operator is fit and proper uh, we have satisfied ourselves that the issue meets the minimum disclosure requirements for people to make an informed choice. But you need to make an informed choice. Otherwise, somebody will say, if a company is listed on the stock exchange, that company's price must never drop. You know? But we know that there are a number of dynamics that would affect how the share price of a listed stock uh, would perform. You know? so, I think that distinction is there. We do our, uh, uh, our review, we do all our checks, but when uh, uh, you, you have to make a decision, satisfy yourself that what I'm being offered, uh, it fits my risk profile. If, because if I license an equity mutual fund, for instance, an equity mutual fund would have a higher risk than a money market mutual fund. So if you buy into the equity fund and you realize that your investment drops, it doesn't mean that SEC didn't do their work or the fact that they have been licensed so that the, the mutual, equity mutual fund can never drop in value. Because the underlying characteristics of the asset class is that the share price can go up and it can go down. So I think we need to understand, because we sometimes confuse uh, ourselves and think, oh, once SEC has uh, uh, license, there should be no issue. We should ask questions. We should understand the risk return characteristics. And if a licensed operator is offering you something that is not licensed by the SEC, that also should make you a license. Or is this thing licensed? And if it's not licensed, then you, uh, you stay away uh, from it. But having said that, uh, we have strengthened or we have taken steps to strengthen our uh, oversight and our supervision to make sure that uh, post the cleanup that we have done, um, you know, the supervision is tighter. So for instance, I mentioned a number of things. We have uh, initiated a digitization program um, to make sure that the ability of uh, the market operators to submit information to us is made more efficient, more timely. That would also allow for more analytical work to be done on the returns that uh, are found. So it's, it's a program that we have uh, initiated uh, to digitize our operations, to move from manual to uh, a digitized platform, to, so that we'll be more nimble, we'll be more efficient, 
uh, in getting information, analyzing or processing information, uh, and, 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 and taking um, action. We have also uh, initiated what we call the risk-based supervision framework uh, that uh, basically focuses on areas that uh, uh, emerging risk are strong, just so that we can take early action where the, uh, the need is more. And, and that's a, a model that um, regulators all over the world are, um, are implementing, the risk-based model. Also because um, no matter the resources you have as a regulator, you'll be constrained. You know? So you are better off focusing on the areas that can uh, engender a lot more risk to the system. So you can take early action and stem, and stem them. Then quite apart from that, we have issued a number of guidelines you know, in recent times. And I'll mention a number of them. We have issued what we call the conduct of business guidelines. That has a number of um, provisions regarding corporate governance, uh, which was a problem for uh, you know, a, a number of the firms that uh, ran into uh, difficulty. And um, so once the corporate governance is strengthened, and it deals with things like composition of the boards, uh, there were some of these companies that had, uh, if you like, family, uh, uh, husband, wife, uh, cousin, you know, so uh, the independence of the board um, was not uh, guaranteed. They will tell you, oh, this person is a non-executive. But being a non-executive director doesn't guarantee independence. So we are stressing on independent non-executive. So there are a number of provisions in the conduct of business guidelines that strengthen the practice of um, corporate governance in the firms that we supervise. We also issued new licensing requirements, which also tightens uh, the requirements of entry. I think a number of the, uh, my colleagues made the point that the entry is very, very important for us. Um, so uh, for instance, apart from minimum capital requirement that has been increased, uh, what we require of directors uh, has been made tighter. Uh, for instance, now we will approve investment guidelines. Now, the investment guidelines uh, provide clear uh, direction on what the farm managers can do and what they also cannot do when it comes to um, managing um, funds of clients. Okay, so that is also something that we have recently um, issued. And, um, the, 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 it leads to us being now able to ensure that um, these guidelines are being, um, being complied with. We have uh, um, done some, some recruitment, and we have a few more just to make sure that the team, um, the team at the SEC uh, is, is solid and, and well uh, positioned to give that, that oversight uh, of of the market. So uh, from the corporate governance issue uh, to various laws or regulations to govern our uh, area, we have strengthened them. Then the last thing I'll mention is uh, the investor education uh, program, uh, because we believe strongly that an informed investor is a well-protected uh, investor. So we have started the time with the SEC is one of them, but that's not the only thing that uh, we are doing. There are other uh, um, um, strategies that we have developed to use to ensure that we keep the investing public informed and well aware of how the market operates, what to expect of our licensed um, market operators, what they can do, what they cannot do, because we believe that once that education gets out there, if, you, if any of our operators approaches you and is offering something, you can say, oh, according to SEC, you can't do this, you can't do that. You know? So that is the, uh, that. The last thing related to investor education is access to information. Uh, if you come to our website, uh, currently we have introduced what we call a color coding uh, framework. So the color coding framework, what it does is that for all our license operators, uh, you can get one color or the other color. Uh, depending on the color or the jersey you're wearing, it may mean that you, you have some outstanding regulatory issues or some outstanding complaints. 
so that if you are going to deal with that company, you can ask questions. You can ask the question, ah, SEC says that you have some outstanding regulatory issues. What are those issues? Why are they still unresolved? So that they can explain to you that, oh, we have taken this step, that step, that step to resolve them. And then the other category uh, where there are no regulatory issues. So you, you know that if I'm going to this place, there are no re regulatory issues. But I can also say that we are even seeking to improve that, uh, to make the information that investors can get out of that um, you know, uh, framework more. Um, that's something that we are doing immediately. But we even have a bigger project. It's called the Financial Data Center, which would pool information. You know, if you, if you have experience in looking for information in Ghana, you know that sometimes it can be a, a tall order. So we have this project where we are, uh, we call Financial Data Center to pull all relevant data into a one-stop uh, uh, place and you can, investors can access it. So these are all steps that um, the SEC has initiated to ensure that we close the gaps and we don't allow um, you know, the market to be rocked or disturbed in, uh, in any way because as you know, uh, protecting the integrity of the market uh, is, is important for us. So uh, these are some of the things that um, I can put it out that uh, we are doing, we have done, and we are doing, and we'll continue to do to ensure we protect investors and the uh, integrity um, of the market. Thank you. Can we put hands together for <laughs> Chairman and Director General of the SEC for that extensive update? Would you like to make any closing remarks as Chairman of the event? Well, as chairman, I just want to say a big thank you once again to Iyoko and uh, CID, the leadership, and indeed the reps who have come here um, for this training. It's a delight to us that uh, you came your numbers and then uh, you paid rapt attention uh, throughout all the uh, presentation. Um, I think it's clear that our area is regulated activity. So um, we, it's not a free for all, um, and people need to observe the rules and the uh, regulations that govern it. Uh, we are committed to ensure that, and we'll continue to count on the support of uh, IOKO um, and uh, CID and all the other law enforcement agencies um, in that regard. Uh, maybe we can only appeal that let's all um, put in some, uh, maybe some speed in our processes, uh, but not sacrifice quality, um, especially when it comes to investigations um, um, for speed. Just that sometimes I think the investing public wants to have things uh, resolved uh, quickly. But I think let's all lift up to our mandate of playing our various roles to um, ensure investor protection. I can say that we at SEC uh, are committed to uh, share and continue to share information uh, with our law enforcement agencies that will facilitate uh, their work. We are happy with the engagement that we've had so far and we look forward to uh, even uh, closer engagement. So that at the end, end of it all, um, it will be a win-win situation. Uh, we achieve our mandate, you achieve your mandate and Ghana is uh, better uh, for it. So those will be my uh, concluding remarks. And we are open for any more engagement. If there are some questions that we didn't answer, um, we are open to uh, engage further because we want you to help us um, help Mother Ghana uh, achieve um, you know, that uh, nation beyond aid uh, status. So thank you for your attention. All right, can we do it one more time for the chairman? All right, by way of announcements, we would encourage you to continue to uh, be in touch as reiterated by the chairman and to reach us and to get more information about what the SEC is doing. You can visit our website, which is www.sec.gov.gh. That's you find on the screen. You can also contact us or send an email to us uh, using info 
uh, at sec.gov.gh. You can reach us on the telephone through a toll-free line, which is 0800 And on social media, we are also very active in responding to any queries and comments you may have. And you can do that by going to at SecGhana across all social media platforms. I believe that the next um, steps from this meeting will be announced soon. As the chairman mentioned, this is the first, but certainly not the last in terms of our engagements. Uh, it's also important to note that we have provided uh, some refreshments in the foyer, so when you come out, uh, you can have something to um, take and uh, enjoy. Uh, let's see, so this would be what we have by way of announcements. And uh, we also believe very much in extending thanks to whom thanks belongs and to do that and to give us a vote of thanks. And the closing prayer is Miss Marilyn Mills from the SEC. Shall we invite her even as we get to the concluding parts of the program? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All protocols observed. As we come to the close of this program, I would like to place on record a heartfelt gratitude to all who have helped us in making this training a resounding success. On behalf of the board, management, and staff of the SEC, we would like to extend our sincere appreciation to God Almighty for his guidance and grace which has sailed us through to this program. Special thanks to the chairman, the director general, and father of the capital market, Reverend Daniel Ogba Mitete, for your leadership, moral support, and initiative in instituting this timely training program. To our honorable guests, the leadership of IOKO and CID, we would like to say a very big thank you to you for taking time out amidst your busy schedules to grace this event. Kudos to all our speakers for the excellent presentations in making this training meaningful and interesting. Also to our participants from the CID, your participation has made this training program successful. And we believe that this training has certainly provided you an insight into the role of the SEC in the capital market. We look forward to working with you to deliver improved collective results. To our very competent MC for moderating this event with professionalism, we also like to say thank you. To staff members of the SEC, your unyielding support cannot go unnoticed. To our partner, Labadi Beach Hotel, we also like to say thank you for hosting this important event. We appreciate you and anticipate future beneficial partnerships. To our distinguished press, we appreciate your relevance in carrying the news of SEC across and beyond. To the project team of the SEC, we also like to say Aiko for planning this program very well. Once again, we'd like to say thank you to everyone here for your active involvement, which culminated in making this training program worthwhile.